Welcome everybody. It's Tuesday, February 27th. It is 614 and this is Manhattan community board ones full board meeting. Um, again, housekeeping reminders. If you are a full board member, you must sit at the table. So you can be heard and we will pass the mics around. Okay, if you have your phones on, please silence your phone. Thank you, Alice, for demonstrating what we're talking about. All right, so let's silence all phones, and that's great. Um, we're going to open up the public session, and um, if you hear your name called and you are in the room, uh, please stand uh, over by the podium, and I'll hand you the mic. All right, so we will go with Benjamin Ratner. First, following Benjamin, it looks you signed on twice, um, and then Jill Goodkind afterwards. There you go. There. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Benjamin Ratner. I am here as an attorney on behalf of the Board of Managers of the 475 Greenwich Street Condominium. I am here just to confirm uh, what occurred in executive committee or following the executive committee meeting with a dispensary applicant, IBUDU New York, um, and to confirm that they withdrew the application uh, in light of um, the condominium's uh, difficulty, if not impossibility of obtaining insurance were a dispensary to locate there as well as a petition of over 670 uh, signatures in opposition. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Next is Jill Goodkind. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. I want to take a moment right now to address a crisis, a meltdown, an issue that is facing renters in our district in Gateway Plaza, one of the largest existing rental units, but really throughout our crisis. And that's market rents can be, and they are, they're being raised to the point of crisis. Our neighbors are being effectively evicted from their homes and our district is becoming even more out of reach. And just to, to give you an example of the effect of this is having on the people in our neighborhoods, I'm gonna read excerpts from a letter from one of my actual neighbors. Uh, okay, here we go. I moved to Gateway in 2021. I was a single mom of three, leaving very difficult circumstances. I was intent on moving to a good neighborhood and find stability and safety with my children. I found it at Gateway. In 2022, my rent was raised by 18%. As a mom, as a witness to the courage of my children, I stayed. I paid my rent on time every month and stretched myself thin for that to happen for, in order for my children not to have to go through another tr transition. I couldn't fathom that my rent would be increased significantly again. At the end of January, I got an email with a rent increase another 19%. I'm constructively being evicted from my apartment. I work for hours on end to ensure my family does not end up without housing. I found potential stable housing out of state. My autistic 12 year old just made honor roll at their middle school. For the first time in their lives, they made close friends in school and they are thriving. I have no choice but to take them out of school mid year. It's breaking my heart as a parent to watch them struggle with this destabilizing reality. I'm being made to leave my apartment with an increase in rent of 41% since I moved in three years ago. Those are the words, the actual words of someone who's undergoing this right now. We need to make this a priority issue for our board. Thank you. I'm taking a look to see if we have anybody else who has 
logged on to speak just to make sure we get everybody. Let's see if I can stay. Okay, without seeing any other people who have signed up for the public session, we're going to move to the public hearing. We open the public hearing and the public hearing at 620 is about a citywide statement of needs SON for fiscal year 2025 and 2026. Do I have anyone who would like to speak on that topic in the room? Seeing no one and seeing no hands raised online. Right. And no one in the room to speak, we close the public hearing at 621 and move on to the business session. Now, we're going to adopt the January 2024 minutes. I want to warn everybody in the room, we do have a deadline tonight. We cannot be here all night. We have a hundred slides in the slide deck. I have one because there's no point in going over everything else. I'm going to tell everybody, please look at the newsletter when it comes out this coming weekend. Please take a look at emails that are coming out from Lucy and Zach and Onej in the office in order to save time tonight in reviewing things. We're just, we're going to really try and post things around. Okay, with that note, let's do an adoption of the 2024 minutes. Do I have a motion? First and second, in, this is a roll call vote for attendance. Take it away, Mimi. Pass the microphone around and say yes. Oh, no, I think you can be really loud. You, I'm not worried about. <laughs> Amoruso. Blank. Brown Kennedy. Cameron. Cassell. Chang. Chapman. Charcutian. Cole. <laughs> Susan not here. Oh, Susan's absent. Oh, okay. Coleman. Thank you. Corman. Thank you. Kucha. Yes. Thank you. Curtis. Thank you. Airman. Bruce. You're right there. Bruce. Voting. No, he's not. He's not in the room. What? Oh my Mitch. God. I'm so sorry, Mitch. I can't believe I got you mixed up with somebody else. That's like literally impossible, and I don't know how I did it. It's like a miracle. Flores. Thank you. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Flynn, yes. Thank you. Forsberg. Thank you. Friedman. Thank you. Roman. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. Galloway. Thank you. Goldstein. Yes. Thank you. Good kind. Thank you. Grayson. Thank you. James. Joyce. Uh, Jew. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Kay. Kay, yes. Thank you. Canel. Patrick. No. Coppell. Okay. Learner. Joe. Oh, sorry, buddy. I can't hear you. Got on mute. Uh, yes. Um, can you unmute him for him? No, he. Uh... I I don't have that power. Sadly. One second, Joe. No, it has to be audio for the recording. Goldstein seems to have something to say. Uh, Paul, no, just forgot you. that. Okay. Um, hey, Joe, if you could figure out how to unmute, just break in any moment. Uh, Lewinson. Lynn. 
Lyon. Thank you. Mahoney. Sad. Yes. Meltzer. Yes. Thank you. Minsley. Minsley, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, Joe. Okay, I'm here. Cool. How do you vote for the yes. minutes? Yes. Thank you. More? Thank you. Pandya? Portia Corey? How do you vote for the minutes? Portia Corey for the minutes. It's like a, a good, yes. you have to you gotta say it out loud. Thank, Thank you. you. Please take a seat at the table if you're a board member. Robinson. Robinson, yes. Yes. Thank you. Rossi. Thank you. Cheer. Thank you. Star. Yes. Thank you. Jimmy Sung. Thank you. Vera Sung. Thank you. Thompson. All right. Townley. It's okay. I'm glad you're here now, though. You. Thank you. Zelter. Is she online? No. Meetings, uh, minutes pass. Minutes pass. Let's go back around one more time to see if anybody else has joined us because we want to make sure we got everybody. Amoruso. Charcutian, Airman, all right, um, James, Joyce, Capel, Lynn Bernard, okay. Mahoney is absent. Pandaya. Thompson. Zelter. Still good. And we have quorum, so let's keep going. Um, let's do the updates from our elected officials. I did see Tevin here. So, Tevin, you're going to go first from Congressman Goldman's office. The lovely mic at the podium, please. like it's on. Good evening, everyone. Hi, CB1. It's good to see everyone this evening. I'm going to give three quick updates. It's Tevin Williams from Congressman Dan Goldman's office. Um, the first thing I would like to say is um, I know that CB1 has been carrying the brunt of the migrant crisis right now, and the congressman led a conversation with the Robin Hood Foundation and all local CBOs in the district um, to talk about the work that they are doing on the ground um, when it comes to handling the migrant crisis. So if anyone has any questions or needs to connect with me after, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. That was joined by all the members and staff of the New York City delegation to Congress, so every member and staffer was there. Um, the next thing I would like to say is um, the congressman has led a left uh, an effort, a letter uh, with Jamie Raskin and also Congressman Nadler to call and urge the Biden administration to facilitate a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, thank you. Um, it is led with 11 other Jewish colleagues, um, and the letter was sent to President Biden last week on Thursday. If you have more questions, I'll leave some copies of the board report back there. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, the Congress has taken the priority of gun violence very seriously. Uh, we did two major events for a New York 10 Gun Violence Awareness Week uh, with public advocate Jamani Williams and then also uh, Brooklyn Borough Advocate or Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Um, out of that came a bill to help survivors and also push for more resources from the federal government. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to take them, but thank you so much. No hands in the room. Are there? Uh, yes, Rosa. Go ahead. Um, Hi, Rosa. Hey, Tevin. How are you doing? Um, so uh, I am part of a citywide parky group, and I know that there is a lot of pressure on open public spaces as relates to the migrant crisis, um, and our parks are incredibly underfunded and understaffed at the moment. Is there anything that could be done at the federal level to help support um, the upkeep and maintenance of these spaces? Um, 
Good while point. this is going on. Yeah, let me um let me follow back up with you on that. I know we've advocated for more funding for the federal parks, but we can talk about that for the city as well. Okay, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Sorry. Any other questions in the room? Seeing none, Mimi, do we have any online? Seeing no hands online. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna go to Senator Kavanaugh's team next, which will be Dan. Byers, who's here, and then followed by the assembly member team, and then the mayor's office, the borough president, and our council member in order. Hey, everybody. Um, keep it brief because this is going really fast. I wanna, can you hear me? Okay. Just want to keep it brief because this is going fast. So I want to respect that. I um, want to point to a couple things that the senator is working on um, as chair of the housing committee, uh, a bill to make housing access, um, it's called the housing access voucher program, excuse me, and it'll enable individuals and families to transition out of shelters or unsustainable housing situations into stable housing. And it will also allow um, local housing agencies to avert evictions for non-payment of rent and other causes of displacement. Um, he's working on a bill that seeks to include veterans um, with service related disabilities among those who receive preferences and affordable home ownership. Um, and the last one that caught my eye was that he's working on a bill that was called the conversion of residential uh, rental buildings to condominium status. And this legislation aims to preserve existing affordable units within uh, large residential buildings after subsidies on those buildings expire. And since you all will be voting on to support this uh, 2963A, which is in relation to ground rent, um, we're excited about this bill. It's intended to promote housing affordability and st uh, stability for income eligible homeowners and renters um, in Battery Park City, which you will hear more about later. But it's passed the Senate before. We are expecting it to pass again. Um, in, in the community, it's we've been working on the same things. Um, notably, though, we had two information sessions about congestion pricing. If you have any outstanding questions about congestion pricing, or if you weren't able to make either of those events, um, feel free to reach out to me or come talk to me after this event. That's it. And thank you very much. Let's see if we have any hands up. Any hands for Senator Kavanaugh's office? Jill, good kind. Hi, Jill. Loud, please. Sorry, give her the mic. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an update on what your office is doing? Wait, wait, one sec. Sorry. Can you give us a quick update on what your office is doing about good cause eviction? Yeah, sure. So I know that it's a priority for um, for the senator to be looking back into this. And so we can follow up afterwards. I can give you more detail with the housing director too. Yeah. Anybody else? Great. You rock. Thanks. Sam. Next, we're going to go to assembly member Glick and I believe Tracy is online and joining us and we're going to drop for you. Those who are not in the room online will drop the link in, in the chat for the report as well. Tracy. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not there in person. I really, uh, I didn't know that it would be such a robust uh, group. Um, so the assembly member is, of course, very focused on the budget right now, as is um, all of the legislature. Um, the primary thing that she would like to highlight is that uh, she is carrying a packaging reduction and recycling infrastructure act which would require manufacturers to uh, bear some financial responsibility for um, the cost of recycling right now those costs are borne by the municipalities um, so new yorkers are paying for recycling and this bill would really put the onus back on the, the producers of the waste materials to bear some of those costs. Um, it includes uh, mandatory reductions in packaging and fees, if a certain fee scale, if the packaging is not reduced, um, and that money would go into municipalities to help pay for recycling. So 
the exciting thing about this is the bill was passed out of committee earlier this month. Um, so we're really hopeful that we can uh, have it pass this session. Um, and then the only other thing I would mention is, as Dan said, uh, Assemblymember Glick was happy to join Senator Kavanaugh to talk about congestion pricing. And we'll remind everyone that comments are still being accepted by the MTA until March 11th. And uh, I think that's it for now, unless anyone has any questions. And I can add our uh, report to the chat if you need me to. Any questions? Yes, Tracy, we have a couple of questions. And yes, please drop the link in the chat. Hi, Tracy. How are you? Um, my question is about the governor's budget. Um, has Sammy's law embedded in the budget, which is, of course, the law that would allow New York City to set its own speed limits? Um, what would what would be the thing that could possibly derail, you know, Sammy's law out of the budget? I mean, what what stop what would stop it from being passed smooth sailing through? Well, I wouldn't have an answer on that. Uh, Assemblymember Glick is not part of the budget negotiating team. Uh, I will say she is a co-sponsor of Sammy's Law, and I know that uh, Assemblymember Rosenthal, who is carrying it in the Assembly, and Senator uh, Hoyleman Siegel on, in the Senate side are both uh, being pretty proactive about getting it passed. So it, it's hard to anticipate. I, I don't anticipate that either House would remove it from their budgets, but I, I don't have any uh, insight into how that's going. But I do know that all of the co-sponsors and certainly the advocacy groups are really pushing hard to, to get it passed through and the and assembly member Glick supports that as well. I have one quick follow-up and that is um, earlier, well actually last Wednesday night, a woman in, uh, sorry, Greenpoint was killed by a driver um, in an F, of an F, F 150, which is a super big pickup truck, but it um, turns out, I mean, he stayed, you know, at the accident scene. She was 49 years old, out to buy a quart of milk, and um, turns out the driver had 26 speed violations, camera speed violations, which, you know, he paid them on time, so there was, there was no repercussions, but apparently Assemblymember Emily Gallagher has a bill she's floating that would um, lead to Rep one the repercussion would be an intelligent speed device that would be required for these drivers to put in their car to keep them under the speed limit. Um, and I, I would hope that the assembly member might support that. Well, thank you. I will, uh, I will call that to her attention. I'm sure it's already on her radar. You may know that assembly member Glick sponsored the speed camera program in the city and in, in school yeah. zones. So it is certainly something that she um, is is usually pretty active on. So I'll I'll make sure to flag that for her and our legislative director in case they haven't see, reviewed it yet. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Zach's getting his steps in today. All right, um, thank you very much, Tracy. Appreciate it. Do we see anybody online with a hand up? Give me one second to just double check. Seeing no hands from our team online. Thank you very much, Tracy, for joining us. And we would love to have you here with us next month in person. All righty, moving on, we have a special guest from the mayor's office, because we usually have Robin, but Robin has sent a motion in his her place. Please join us at the mic. Hello, CB1. Um, nice to be out here. Here we go. All right, everyone hear me now? Um, I was here a few months ago, and my name is Moshe Davis. I'm from the community affairs office of the mayor, um, Eric Adams, and really nice to be with you. Um, last time I was here, I think it was in September, um, there was a discussion about coastal resiliency. Um, they wanted the mayor's office to be part of that. I um, know something I was like, oh, great, I'm happy to follow up on it. Um, the mayor's office started a new, um, brought in a new director at that point, um, Elijah Hutchinson. And I am grateful to uh, announce today that um, the mayor will be doing a battery park, battery coastal resiliency groundbreaking 
um, and this is part of the state of the city and putting in $200 million um, for this project, hopefully to be announced in the spring this year. Um, I know one of the committees is look is going to have a meeting with um, EDC um, and the other relevant agencies, including uh, Maki J, to be able to um, continue this and make sure that the community is done in the way the community wants it. Um, other updates um, I'd like to give about the migrant crisis. I know that there is a discussion about um, Beekman um, shelter. Um, and Robin is facilitating some discussions about that, and I hope that the discussions that go along with the committees work out well. Um, just general numbers for the city. Um, our city has received um, over 177,000 asylum seekers, and we only have now 70,000 in the care of the city. So they are getting on their own. It's a great number. It's a great thing to realize that, you know, as many people are coming here, they are not, not just under uh, the city's responsibility at this point. So we thank you. Um, for your help in the community, because I know that TB1 has been very integral in making sure that the community has been working really well um, to make sure to integrate these migrants. Um, hold on, hold on. You okay. can't speak without the mic because of the setup tonight. So we would love to hear what you have to say. Let him finish his report and then raise hands for questions because I do see a couple of questions in the room already. All right, so just give us a second. All right. Um, just another problem oh, here. The passion, love passion. Um, just one other project Mayor is working on is a lawsuit against social media companies to making sure that they're responsible for the mental health of our youth. Um, it's a health crisis. Um, so Mayor announced a lawsuit against the major social media companies, and we hope that will make a difference um, for that. Um, another thing I mentioned, someone brought up about uh, parks, um, and the city has restored funding to parks budget. Um, we had many budget cuts. Um, however, the most things that have been cut have been restored. So we're really glad to announce that specifically also for parks, um, the staffing will be back and they'll clean up everything. The, the, the funding is going to be there. Um, just another thing I mentioned last time, and then I'll finish up. Um, last time I mentioned there's a text number for the mayor. So I just want to remind everyone about that. It's 917-909-2288, or you can go to hearfromeric.com and you could see all the ways to join the WhatsApp channels and to get here from the mayor. I'm happy to take any questions. Sure. 917-909-2288. Before we go to questions from board members, for any board members who have arrived within the last 10, 15 minutes, please sit in the front row. If you've set up someplace on a lovely table, please move to the front row because we have to get mics to you. So just make it easier for the team who's in their steps in. Okay. So... Hands up. We're going to start with Bruce and hold on, and then Justine, and then Bandaya, and we'll see who else's hands are up. I'll have one. Start. Hi, I, I don't know if you discussed this. You might have, and I don't know if it's your purview, but insofar as the mayor's office is concerned, uh, Blasio's uh, uh, sterling premier uh, uh, accomplishment was free preschool for all. It's my understanding that Mayor Adams is cutting back funding for that substantially and that people are now scrambling for preschool affordability. Is, is that, can you address that question if you haven't already? Um, so the mayor announced many um, budget cuts specifically because of uh, the migrant crisis that has affected New York City. However, based on um, the fiscal outlook that's gonna be coming up for the next year, he's hoping to restore all that funding. Um, I think I don't think the full budget is out yet, but I hope that um, I don't have all information exactly of what programs, we're looking to restore all funding specifically for um, preschool. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Um, so I have to call you back to the beginning of what you said about the, the mayor showing up at a ground break breaking in Battery Park for resiliency. Did we just hear you wrong? Can you say that again? Sure, sure. Um, we are looking to have a battery park resiliency project and looking to have the brown breaking later on this year in the spring. So are you are aware that Battery Park City is like full swing with the resiliency project. It's the only governmental, quasi-governmental en entity that's doing anything. Not true. Well, I mean, the battery is also doing something too. Maybe you're talking about that, but that is in conjunction with the South and West. No, it's extra. All right. All right. It would be interesting to hear more about that. Sure. So I believe so I'm 
um, I could get you full information if you want to speak afterwards. Yeah. Um, there is going to be more discussions happening with this better park resiliency, I think, with a different discussion with CB1. Don't have all the details. All I do know is that this was a topic that was under interest to people, and I know that there's some good things coming up. Yeah. We'd <laughs> you want more details. Certainly, we'd like to be broke in the process and part of the partnership for whatever new plan the mayor has for Battery Park City, the Northwest resiliency, resiliency that goes up through Tribeca, and the perspective and view of how we can protect all of Lower Manhattan. Okay, so I think on, there's going to be a walkthrough on March 6th um, that someone is scheduling. Don't have the full information. Yes. Yeah, I mean, do me a favor. We would love to hear more details. Awesome. We'll follow Please, up Please. Sure. The sooner the better, because March 6th is next week. So if you could get us something tonight or tomorrow, we'd be delighted to share it with the public to ensure that any type of walkthrough actually has public perspective. For sure. For sure. Okay. All right. Let's uh, pass the mic over. Yeah. Um, Pandaya? Well, my first point was on that 200 million, already a billion something is being spent. So I just want to make sure there's no overlap. The second was on the asylum. Were you saying 177,000 asylum seekers are in the city, but the city is only working with 70,000? I just wanted to understand what was this gap you were talking about? So of the, all the asylum seekers that have arrived in New York City? 177? Yeah. And what's the 70? Of the people who are currently in the care of New York City. So there's 100,000 not in the care. Where are they? They have either gone other places, okay. taking care of their own, on their own. Okay. And then my final point was you said all funding was being restored, and I care a lot about community composting. So will community composting funding be restored? And where is the money coming from? I will follow up about the community composting. Because that should be a priority. We would definitely like to know because that has impacts all over Lower Manhattan, Governor's Island, and everywhere. So community composting, we'd love a great update on that. Sure. On budget. Does okay. Uh, Rosa Chang, you're next with a question, and then I'm going to look online. Thank you very much. Um, so back to the parks thing. Uh, I believe that the budget budget uh, has is about fifty million dollars lower for parks um, in twenty twenty five than it it was in twenty twenty four. So there is actually still a cut, and we are looking to try and get one percent of the city budget for parks. And so whatever you can do to help get us there, we believe that. Our public spaces are absolutely essential community spaces, and we would love to get the city to fund these spaces so that they're safe and clean. And we'd really appreciate your support on that. Um, and then underlining the whole composting thing, we know that the composting budget, especially for our lower Manhattan community composters, is incredibly low. It's not it's not a huge amount. We're just talking like a few million. Um, and they are incredible and important jobs and they actually return healthy soil into our community parks and um, so whatever we can do to try to keep these programs and these jobs going uh, we would super appreciate thank you very much okay great yeah mayor, the composting is a priority of the mayor and we hope that we're able to do as much as we can in your area so, so thank you so much um one of the projects that got announced um on the parks front with the novelty is the plus pool that the governor and the mayor have both supported publicly, which I just want you to know, I'm so excited. You don't even understand. We all want to so swim in the river. It's a great idea. It's on many, many levels, and it already has tremendous community buy-in up and down. I wanted to just see one of the things that we have been advocating strongly, and we've heard that the mayor this office is where it's still being decided is the location and I just want to say that this neighborhood has advocated longer and harder we do not have a public swimming pool there is a million reasons why it should come here and right under the Brooklyn Bridge would get every picture the mayor's face would go all over the world and people would love to swim under the Brooklyn Bridge which is quintessential New York and I just want you to know that that will 
resonate with the world, not just the United States. And I'm I'm gonna you know go on and on. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I do know this has been noted uh, for CP1 to have us in the area. Um, I don't know where the plans are right now to have where they're going to be placed, um, but definitely we'll make sure that keep you guys in the. Your office should have a letter from us. We we and CB3 join together. We have a, we have a great plan, and it'll be fabulous. The mayor would be thrilled. Yes, I heard about that, and I'm thankful you guys are so excited about this program. I just wanted to confirm with everyone that you're correct. There is a tour of the battery. I don't know if that's what you were referring to in terms of resiliency tours on March 6th from 4 to 5. We will be posting that on the community board's website. But this will be given by EDC and Hunter Roberts. And I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but just to confirm. That sounds accurate. Okay. That sounds accurate. You're next. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear what uh, the mayor is doing uh, to provide housing to these immigrants coming in, because a lot of them, you know, other than shelters, don't have a place to permanently settle down. So I want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so uh, our shelter system is definitely over capacity um, because migrants and we're opening new locations. Um, our goal is to make sure that they are housed on their own and not be able to necessarily, but at the same time, we're looking to build more housing, more affordable housing. The mayor just announced 1,500 new, new full housing thing from the city um, with the people with the ready, um, with the vouchers. Um, and we hope that these programs can be expanded um, they don't necessarily know for migrants. We have many people in the city that are looking for housing as well. Um, but more housing is helpful for everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I see no other hands online and no hands other in the room. So thank you. Tell Robin she, you know, missed a good one. Alrighty. Um, next, we're actually joined by Assembly Member Falls Fatim. He is online with us, Shabani. So, welcome, Fatim. Feel free to unmute yourself and turn your camera on. And we're delighted to have you here. Hey, Tammy. Thank you so much, CB1. I actually just stepped out in my car. Uh, we're actually co-hosting an event this evening, so um, I couldn't be there with you all in person. But just wanted to pop in and give a few updates. Um, I want to just say thank you to the entire community board, um, council member, Christopher Marte and district leader, Mariama James, um, for the fantastic in our world black, black history month event that we had, um, this past month, uh, early in February. Um, so it, it was a great success and I just want to say thank you to everyone that participated and played a role, um, in, in making it happen. I just wanted to provide some updates. On some recent bills uh, that the assembly is uh, introducing, um, starting first with the Consumer Protection and Automotive uh, Transparency Act. Uh, so this bill aims to enhance transparency in the automotive industry by ensuring accurate uh, disclosure of materials used in vehicle interiors. Uh, it seeks to prevent uh, deceptive marketing practices and protect consumers financially and ethically. Um, and then the second bill that we just introduced uh, this week is the Cannabis Oversight and Official Engagement Act. Um, and this bill aims to uh, amend the existing uh, cannabis uh, law, which is uh, Section 76A, uh, titled a Notification to Elected Officials of Adult Use Retail Dispensary License. Um, what this would do is it would seek to enhance uh, transparency and engagement in the licensing uh, process by establishing requirements for notifying elected officials about uh, applications for adult use uh, retail dispensary licenses. Um, now, the notification for this bill um, would would suggest that the Office of Cannabis Management must notify all elected officials representing legislative districts where proposed adult use retail dispensaries would be located before approving any license applications. Uh, notices must include various details about the proposed dispensary and must be sent to us at least 30 days before the decision is made. Um, so that's the second bill. And then the third bill um, 
is an act to amend the public health law in relation to really? prohibiting the sale of vape products that resemble school supplies. Um, now, the purpose of this legislation is to ensure that any place of business where tobacco and other vaping products are being sold do not carry products intentionally packaged to appeal to our youth um, in the form of school supplies and other related products. Um, now, this this specific bill was 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 really important to us because, um, you know, as of September 2023, the FDA actually sent over 15 letters uh, to online retailers warning them to cease selling e-cigarettes and vapes that resemble toys and supplies, noting that they are an attempt to target children. So um, this bill was was very crucial for us. So very happy to introduce it. And, and uh, we feel very strongly about that one. And then lastly, I just wanted to provide an update on the Holiday Inn um, uh, migrant shelter at 99 Washington Street. Um, so we've been in contact with the residents uh, nearby and some of the issues that, that they've raised to our office um, has been you know, loud music and noise in general, um, increased public drinking and drug use, increased garbage accumulation, rat infestations, um, unlicensed scooters in the neighborhood, debris being thrown out the windows, um, you know, lack of curfew or enforcement uh, at the shelter. Uh, so it's just provided a lot of, you know, concerns to residents nearby. Um, the assemblyman just sent a letter uh, to the deputy mayor for housing and economic workforce development, um, deputy mayor Tor Springer. So we sent a letter uh, to the deputy mayor and we're hoping to get a meeting uh, sometime in the coming week or so. Uh, just to address these concerns, and so we'll definitely make sure to keep you all um, in the loop as far as uh, further developments um, after that meeting. So just wanted to provide those updates. Again, thank you all so much. Um, if there's any questions you have for me, happy to answer on here or offline. Um, I'll also drop my number and my email in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, don't go anywhere. We've got some questions for you. Um, hey. I have a question. For me specifically, I'm yes. going to go first. Um, I have a question about the bill you've got that you're pushing forward because yes. it's yes. not just RDO retail dispensaries that are going to be an issue. It's on sign consumption event organizers. It's there are four or five different types of licensed applications beyond card and retail dispensary. So how does the bill? handle and work with all of the others. I'd hate for it to apply to one type of business and not be able to be applied to the others. Yeah, so Tammy, that's a great question. So specifically for this, um, we've obviously gotten so many concerns about, you know, legal shops in, in lower Manhattan as, and as well as uh, the rest of our district in Staten Island and, and, and parts of Brooklyn. Um, so this specifically would be for those illegal shops but obviously, you know, we're open to uh, amending it and, and, and changing things up to obviously apply uh, to the other institutions as well. Uh, but the reason sort of the way this bill came about was um, in that section 76A, um, we were told by OCM that only the municipalities, the county clerks, and I believe the community board is mandated to sort of let the elected officials know about these shops opening up within the district. And so we reviewed the bill. And so there was no sort of baseline communication that OCM has with elected officials in any district. And so that was a huge gap that was sort of missing. And I think obviously this has created such a larger problem where, you know, not only the community, but the residents nearby and 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 the businesses are just not um, aware of, of just sort of anything as far as communication before these, before these shops are opening up. So, um, let alone sort of the application process, that's been sort of a, a disaster to begin with. So, okay, doke. Do I have hands up in the room other than mine was? Seeing none, do I see any online? Seeing none, I want to thank you very much, team, for coming, and thank you for being with us. We are love to have you in person if you'd like to join us next month. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. All righty. Let's move on to the borough president's office. Is Andrew here? Seeing no borough president's office. Max, you're up.
Hey Tammy, I'm I'm hey, Tammy, I'm I'm online. Y'all hear Sorry. me? Sorry. See, Tammy, I'm by the go for it. Um, I'm here, um, and... Yes. Hi. Hey, everybody. Um, Andrew here from the Manhattan Borough President's Office. I just have three quick things I want to announce. One is that we're having our Manhattan State of Borough this coming Sunday, March March 3rd, at, uh, at the K Playhouse at Hunter College on 68th Street. Street. At The program will begin around 2 p.m. Around. Sunday, March 3rd, Hunter College, 68th Street, K, K Playhouse, 2 p.m. This Sunday. Secondly, we did extend community board applications for everybody. Um, they're now due March 8th, and that will be it. After that, we'll more or less begin interview sessions. So if you haven't applied, new applicants, reapplicants, the deadline now is. Friday, March 8th. Um, and then lastly, we, uh, we, we laid out a, um, our own housing agenda, uh, reports proposal to for Albany. We laid out 8 housing policies that we believe need to be accomplished this year. This includes replacing the 421A tax exemption. Facilitating office conversions, lifting the 12 FIR cap on residential residential development, strengthening and, and expanding the right to council statewide and within the city of New York, along with um, some other points. So it's on our website in the policy initiative section. Our it's our 2024 housing agenda to Albany, and with that, that will be my report for this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have oh, Jill Goodkind? You are first up with questions. You want to jump to there so we don't have to run for the mic. And after um, Andrew goes, uh, Fanny, I think you joined us from Assemblymember Lee's office, so thank you. We'll get to you next. Sorry, Max. I just filled out and submitted my community board application, as I'm sure many people here have as well. On this application and the one before that, I have pointed out in the uh, section where people uh, identity groups that there is no uh, heading for seniors. Senior citizens are a very special group in this community. They have special needs from food insecurity, loneliness, transportation issues, medical issues. So I've brought this up two times and I'm wondering why uh, the borough president's office doesn't consider seniors uh, one of those groups. Uh, okay, I, I I can I personally cannot answer answer that. I will talk to Trisha Shimamura, my supervisor, and um, let me see uh, if we can like schedule a follow up uh, call with you later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions in the room for the borough president's office? Again. Just to repeat, if you haven't reapplied yet, the new deadline is March 8th, and I promise you it will not be extended. So get your paperwork in, please. We love all of your happy participation. Seeing no uh, uh, hands online other than yours, Andrew, thank you so much. And Fanny, you're next from Assemblymember Lee. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Hi, can you guys hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, Fanny, loud, very loud and clear. <laughs> okay, great. Um yeah, sorry I, I couldn't be there today. I didn't know that um you guys are having in person, but um I just again I only have a few things quickly. Um so um assembly the assembly member is up in Albany, he's working on the session, the budget, um and also he's um, conducting budget hearings on the committee that she sits on, which is housing, environmental, conservation, banks, and social services. Um, so we spent a lot of um, sp we spent a lot of time on the issue of Lunar New Year. Um, he got she got the passage of the legislation to make Lunar New Year a statewide school holiday. And also, um, yes, on yep. Sunday. 
The assembly member was the grand marshal of the parade of the Chinatown Lunar New Year Parade, where she also conducted a breakfast prior to the parade. Um, let's see. In celebration of both Lunar New Year and Black History Month, um, the assembly member hosted a panel with Senator Jamal Bailey to discuss the history of solidarity between Asian and Black communities in the US and ways they can continue collaborating to uplift vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, we had our congestion pricing information session event um, with, Brian, with Senator Brian Kavanaugh. So we will be using the input from the event to form official recommendations to submit to the MTA. And we are also continuing to do what we can to make our community's voices heard during the implementation of this program. And, um, and that's about it. Fantastic. Do I have any questions for Assembly Member Lee's office? Okay, looks like you're all set. There are no hands up and thank you. Uh, Sunday was a lot of fun. So for those who, <laughs> who got to go. Alrighty. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Max, I promise. Spotlight is all for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Max Deutsch. I work for Council Member Christopher Marte. Um, so just a few uh, legislative updates for this month. Uh, so first, two weeks ago, the Council Member reintroduced a bill uh, that would require Department of Sanitation violations to be accompanied by a picture of the violation. Um, this is kind of a transparency thing where very often our office, I'm sure Community Board 1, gets, you know, calls from a constituent. I got a $200, you know, illegal dumping violation. I didn't do it. And it's very hard to kind of contest that because Department of Sanitation might have, it might happen two weeks ago and there's no real way to prove whether or not that, you know, that actually happened, that violation took place. So this would just allow constituents to better contest their violations and also allow the Department of Sanitation to defend itself when it did rightfully give a violation. So we are hoping to have a hearing on this bill in March. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned if you, uh, you know, subscribe to our newsletter because when we do get a hearing scheduled, uh, we will be, uh, yeah, sending that out. And then tomorrow we'll be introducing two pieces of legislation, a package of uh, the first bill, what we're, we call the Park Your Bike Bill, would require the Department of Sanitation, uh, sorry, the uh, Parks Department to create sheltered bike parking in parks of a certain size throughout the city. Uh, so this would do a complex number of things. First, it would allow just, you know, you can park your bike. You don't have to worry about rain, wind, uh, snow. You can park your bike in kind of a safer, more environment, uh, safer from the elements, as well as, you know, slightly more secure. While they won't be locked, we can't, you know, put out publicly locked bikes, because, uh, like sh uh, sheds, because then who you know, people can't access it. But you know, there have been studies done that even just having a shed, having it in this entire contraption over your bike, people are less likely to steal a bike when it is, you know, fully enclosed. And we also just think this is a way to, to increase park access, biking access, as well as be a model for future, uh, I guess, enclosed biking storage. And so we'll be introducing that tomorrow and we'll be having a press conference tomorrow to inter um, around about that bill in front of City Hall Park tomorrow at 11 a.m. if people want to join. And we'll also be at that press conference announcing a bill we're introducing with Council Member Eric Dinowitz up in the Bronx that would require uh, city-owned buildings to uh, uh, similarly uh, provide bike storage when feasible in city-owned buildings, including schools. Um, that would, again, just allow the 400,000 city employees, you know, if you want to bike to work, um, when feasible, if it's able to be put in that building, that would give, again, hundreds of thousands and visitors as well the opportunity to park and to bike to work and have a place where they can park their bike and safely park their bike. And, yeah, that's all I have for, for this month, so I'm happy to take any questions. Wow. Wow. Okay. So we're going to go in order. There are lots of hands up. Hands up first, so I'm going to call order so we know which way we're going. We're going to go Gerald, Jared, Eric, and Rosa. Um, so this, this bike storage, how, how will that affect city bike is, is it, is it going to, uh, are we going to now have sheds all over the city for city bikes as well? So yes, these, these wouldn't be part of city bike. Um, yeah, these would be, these would be just for your own personal bike. So not, not connected to city bike. So city bike can't come to, to the city and say, okay, we now want bike storage sheds in the street. I mean, maybe they can, but again, you know, that, that's a contract negotiation. You know, City Bike has their own contract negotiations with, with the city on that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's again, currently, yeah, there's been no discussion about how City Bike would, would impact that. Okay. 
you. Uh, Max, just a comment uh, addition to the uh, the sanitation one. I am the lucky recipient of two of those uh, violations uh, on behalf of, I mean, I guess it was a, basically a roulette of which of the 30 apartments in our building got it. I'm the lucky recipient. I'm the one who has to go and actually, you know, fight it and dispute it at, at an oath hearing. But at the end of the day, it's a 30 unit building. Um, it'd be great if there's something that could be added to that so that it has to be assigned to an actual responsible entity. Right. Um, instead of an individual apartment. Right. Yeah. Apartment. And, and that's a good. Yeah. And I know kind of one thing, part of, I think the picture, you know, cause often what the department of sanitation, you know, their actual guidelines as you know, from my understand is they're supposed to find some kind of, you know, they, they're only supposed to send it to a specific apartment if right, they find like a mail or a package that has that address. So, so what the, you know, requiring the picture would do is right. They can't just send it to a random person. And say, oh, we think it was you, they would have to prove well, that it was you who. Well, so in this case, that. in this case, they did because one was from one side of the building and the other location that was listed on the opposite end of the building. So now what I actually have to do is also figure out how to prevent it from continuing to happen. Right. No, yeah, yeah, that's uh, a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something that. that could be worked in. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, can't as, be the only one. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, as we have the hearing, you know, these are yeah, issues we, you know, we can discuss about, you know, and work on. Um, yeah, Max, I want to say I think that's a splendid idea about sanitation requiring the uh, enforcement agents to actually take a picture that will be time stamped yeah. because I've heard a lot of com uh, frustrations from from residents where they get a summons, but it's hard for them to defend it, defend themselves without any evidence being proffered, offered by, by the enforcement agents. Um, and so the picture would be time stamped, so that, that's great. Um, now, with the with the bike shelters um what would be the hours meaning that we don't want people to leave their bikes there overnight yeah what would the rules be um because i i noticed that <clears throat> at many of the other city like um bike stands uh, that are on the sidewalk people leave them there <laughs> forever you know and there there needs to be some enforcement or maybe there are rules but it shouldn't be there more than a few days or there should be a, a set time each week, I don't know, let's just say 3, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., where if your bike is there, it it will be seized because it, it turns out in many places, it ends up be forever parking. They they never remove their bike. No, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's the, me and the cast member actually had that exact conversation today about, you know, kind of, yeah, seeing if we can add an amendment to, or edit the bill to, yeah, put some kind of overnight uh, yeah, to, to prevent overnight parking, at least in, you know, maybe certain parks. I don't know if it's a problem because 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 it's a problem or are existing parks grandfathered because they don't necessarily have a space set aside to be able to integrate new sheltered parking for bikes. Yeah. And I guess the interesting thing about sort of that sort of skeleton or the infrastructure that we have just on the sidewalks in general is that it's incredibly unobtrusive and takes incredibly little space. Um, whereas a shelter situation, even if a bike wasn't being parked there or a series of bikes weren't being parked there, it would permanently be taking over that space yeah. from other park usage um, and pedestrian access. And then the last question is, um, is there any funding attached to this? Because I know that parks are incredibly underfunded at the moment. And so if there is a requirement to install these new um, bike protective locations or shelters, um, where is that money coming from? So, yes, yeah, so I'd say on the first thing, I, I guess one thing I should have clarified, it would avail currently as written, it would only be for parks over two and a half acres. So it wouldn't be so smaller parks where that space just doesn't exist. And it would also be, a kind of case-by-case -case basis where if it's not, it, it would also be only where it's feasible. So if a park, just again, if there isn't the space, the parks department can say it doesn't work here and, you know, th th that exemption can be made. And there would have to be, they would have to 
provide the way the bill is drafted currently, they would have to provide the community an, an explanation as to why it's not feasible. And then in terms of funding, no, that, that is a, a good question. And that, that's, you know, yeah. because we're only introducing the bill tomorrow. So it hasn't been introduced, but that is the conversation. Once it's introduced, that conversation we can start having with parks to figure out, yeah, you know, making making it feasible. Okay, because it, it would just be difficult for parks if there is no funding to be able to do that when they're already sort of strapped and, and understaffed and not sanitized and all of that other, you know, basic essential stuff. Thank you. Um, I'm curious what these look like, and I'm certain that'll be part of the rollout, but I am curious as to who is overseeing this. Is, is this the Public Design Commission or who? So it's, it? Yeah, so it's. Currently, it, it's the parks. Um, yeah, parks department. It, it all falls under parks uh, currently. So the public design commission will be not looking at these pieces of, as furnishings or furniture for the city public spaces. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, currently, and I think I, I, one of the reasons you know why we do want this feedback because you know there is I think yeah a lot. It, it is it's very it's going to be a very new thing, and so yeah, these are definitely yeah concerns that I you know will bring back and see if we can that's even make, a make major concern. That. Yeah. That's a that's a significant piece of uh, equipment potentially on a, on a in a city park. Thanks. So I'm going to pass the mic around to Andrea next, but we would love if the council member or yourself would come to a committee and talk a little bit more in detail about the bill so sure. we could actually have a larger amount of public input. Yeah, definitely. Have these bike sheds been done in other parks in other parts of the country or other parts of the world? So yeah, so there are. Idea. Yeah, so, you could like, give us pictures of what you're trying to achieve. Cause yeah, yeah. So there are. Yeah, I can. I mean, yeah. So in London, there's something they have called the cycle hangers, um, which is what, what kind of what the council member based the idea off of. They are a little different because those are they're private where you have to pay and you get the key and you can unlock it. But design wise, um, yeah, I can try and find. Uh, I mean, I can pull up a picture of it <laughs> really quick. Um, a cycle hanger. Okay, yeah, then I'll, I'll we'll, we'll bring a picture at committee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. We'd much rather you come to committee with a full presentation okay. so we can bandy about and then we'll give you the most amount of feedback and be able to have some of our local parks conservancies and others come because I'm sure they'd be rather curious and interested to hear as well. All right, great. Yeah, yeah, we, we can definitely do that. Okay. Any other um, any other questions? Francis was that end? Okay. Anybody online have a question? Okay. Max, thank you so much. Thank you. Nice robust report. We really appreciate the time. All right. So let's move on from our elected officials and Zach Bomber, chair report, uh, DM report. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, and thank you everyone for bearing with us as we are down here in the mezzanine working through uh, technical and space issues, so I appreciate that. Hopefully next month we will be upstairs uh, if their work is all complete. Um, Bob, you raised your hand. Bob, Bob likes this room better for for the people online. Okay, so um, uh, oh no, slides. So first is City Parks Foundation. They have a parks grant for one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars to support more equitable and vibrant parks. Um, letters of interest are due Thursday, March seventh. So if you have an organization that's interested, uh, March seventh, you do a letter of interest, and then if they uh, like what they see, uh, they will respond back to you to do a formal application. Uh, next slide, OEM has their 2024 Community Preparedness Symposium. That is on March uh, 6th at uh, Baruch College, and that's from 8 to 4. And next, uh, Department of Sanitation, their um, business uh bins all bins have to um the 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 rollout of the of uh, uh the garbage collection with with bins is is starting march 1st so um if you see those uh you should start seeing those on the street that's the official start date and they can't be put out uh, before eight o'clock or an hour 
uh, before closing. Next slide. Uh, Mayor's launched Chinatown Connections. Uh, I believe it's in the chair report, so I will skip over uh, that for you. And uh, finally, for environmentalists, this, this is good news. Uh, New York signed a formal agreement this month to ensure heat pumps make up 65% of statewide residential heating, cooling water, um, cooling and water heating equipment sales by 2030 and 90% by 2040. So more heat pumps uh, coming to the city. And that's it for me. Next slide, please. Okay, I promise this is gonna be super short. Zach put up all the details about the connection to Chinatown. CB1 hopefully will have a uh, seat on the conversation because we have half of the connections to Chinatown. We have the opposite side of it. That uh, you can see that picture from Kim Lau Square. Um, it's been a really busy month. Lucy will yell at me about my um, organization on my slide, but it is what it is. Thanks to uh, Assembly Member Lee. As you can tell from the February updates, that was our China Chinese New Year Lunar New Year breakfast um, in Chinatown, which Zach and Mark and Susan and Andrea and I and many of our board members were there. It was a really fun event and we got to walk in the parade, which was, if you've never been to the Lunar New Year parade, it's wildly fun. Um, Again, if you're out and about in Lower Manhattan and you want to see your photos in the slide deck, please send them to Zach and I. And that's the end of my chair report. Again, oh yeah, I told you short. Reapply to the community board. Please make sure you've signed in for attendance tonight. And let's take it away to the next. Cannabis Resolution 149 Church Street, Cloudfather, LLC. Danny, it's Darren. Question. Yep. Um, Darren, your question? Yeah, um, you just mentioned the reapplications. You know, I, I get very, um, it's, uh, you know, OCD um, about this stuff. If, they, if you get that reply, like I submitted it a couple of weeks back and got the online reply. Is that sufficient? Do I need to follow up with Andrew or someone else in the office just to be 110% sure they got it? Or we, we, we go if we get the automatic reply? If you received an email today, from the borough president's office saying we we do you are due to reapply mm -hmm. and the new extension date that means they probably don't have it so i would tell you to reply to that email and double check and i, I think i'll count I, late I, this afternoon okay so that was specific because i saw something late last week in the borough president's office about um it was just like the regular thing and then one of the about is extended to march 8th you're saying today uh, all people who have not applied or they have received I've got something, something else. We'll connect to offline with Andrew, who can check to make sure you're all set. How's that? Thank you. Appreciate you're it. welcome. All righty. We are at 149 Church Street. This is a resolution for Cloudfather LLC denial of a cannabis retail dispensary. All right. We'll take them separately because one's a denial and one's an approval. Anybody have any questions on the first one? A questions call and it's second. So if you were not here for the vote on the minutes, which by my list, I have Airman, James, Turkudian, Pandaya, Curtis, maybe, and Zelter, you must do an audio vote, no matter what it is. Okay. Oh, never mind. Curtis, we got you. Sorry about that. Turkudian okay. was next. All right, so this is, it's been called and seconded. This is a vote for affirmation. Bruce, please mute your phone. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna assume everybody is a yes. Are there any yeses that are, we're not here for the first vote? It needs to be auditory. Charcutian votes yes. But Zelter, Charcutian, and Airman, yes. That's a James, yes. Yes, yes Charcutian votes yes. Thank you. Uh, and that was Joyce, I heard as yes. well. Thank you. Yes. All right. Are there any no's? Learner, no. 
I don't know. Are there any abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Next one is approval of the cannabis retail dispensary at Dreambox LLC, which is 386 now. Um, Alice has a couple uh, additions she'd like to add in here. Um, I guess this is you, Tammy, and Zach. Uh, at the meeting, we were told that the applicant would go back to get the petition signatures that were missing and that we were waiting for those to approve. And I want to point out, and this must be included because I did discuss it during the meeting, that this, if I'm not mistaken, this is the location that's across from the Betty Ford Alcohol and Drug Abuse Rehabilitation Center. So I do think that's something, I, I know, Tammy, that the point that you'll make is that that's not um, by law, but I would argue it is a relevant point that could be picked up in the resolution. And so I've asked for that then, and I will repeat the ask now um, and hope that it is accepted. Um, the point of the bringing this up again is Zach and Tammy, what, what number of signatures did we get? Um, and where are those signatures? And did and one of the promises made was that the applicant would actually speak with the Betty Ford um, clinic. I can take that for you. So we did receive this week the or actually late Friday night a list of signed signatures from people who are very local to the area who were in support of the location. So. There is a full page of a one page signature and a filing receipt that was sent. So that is the answer on the stips. Yes, we did. Hold on. Um, for we did not request hard copies. We have them online. Um, we asked them to reach out and go across the street to talk to the clinic. But that is two things. One, it's not illegal. Two, we've already approved one. And three, there's also a bar across the street. We never asked them to do that. So we need to be a little bit um, mindful and not necessarily wave the flag on that. Okay. I live on the corner. So to say that they reached out to the neighborhood, I saw absolutely nothing that indicated that there was anything going on. But I guess what you're saying is they can just simply call people. I don't know how they're reaching out, but certainly there was no indication that there was anything that was being asked of anybody in the neighborhood because I am on the corner. And as far as the point about the drug rehabilitation center, I would think that if you're on a corner that has two things, a drug rehabilitation center and an office building, if I'm not mistaken, and you don't go to the drug rehab center as one of the groups that you might want to ask, what do they think of this? It's to me an egregious overstep. So, uh, Justine, I hand up, then Rosa, then Bruce. Thanks so much. So, um, I guess my response would be they did provide, so Tammy, to make it clear, they did provide signatures. Was there any signatures from the, the clinic that, that you don't see any? You can't. Got it. So we don't know that they did or they didn't. Okay. And then so that, that stipulation has been met. And then the accessible bathroom, it's when they open and if they open. So that's fine. Um, yeah, no, I support this because like we said, we passed this before and we've approved it. I just wanted to express my concern about the location, especially that it is in um, immediate proximity to several park spaces outdoors and that they are also active recreation spaces. And um, I think, you know, I haven't looked at the location to see about school locations in the vicinity, but it's it's concerning to me because I do think that there is a natural tendency if you are going to smoke something that you're going to smoke it in a nice park setting, which then makes it inhospitable for other people who do not want to be secondhand smoking. Um, it, I can tell you it happens anyway. Where exactly on Canal Street is is this? Right here. In the, because what you're what you're describing as West Broadway. So, so there's a locksmith. So we're and the the, the, the hamburgers the hamburger store. 
And why is the, the reason why I'm trying to be specific is because what you're talking about the Betty Ford Center, I'm assuming you mean Hazelton between Lisbonard and Canal. And from the day Judith Moyers came here 14 years ago to appeal for that space. And I was the first to raise my hand because I knew the reaction would be, oh, drug, drug users in our neighborhood, when in fact, this was just the opposite. It's a misnomer to, first of all, to call it a, a drug. It's uh, many friends and neighbors of yours who go to AA meetings there and who, who you know, Nancy Whiskey Bar was always on the corner, that's true. But I do think that regardless of the law and regardless of my position that the people who are out of jail and who can be licensed should be given a chance here. I think it's not a very good idea to bracket Hazelton on one side with Nancy Whiskey Bar, which has been there forever, and on the other side, a, a pot dispensary. I just think Thank it's ridiculous. Thank you, Bruce. Jared is next, so let's pass it all the way down, please. And then Mariama will take the last. And cut the cross chatter, please. Out of curiosity, did they come back with the survey to the Tribeca Early Learning Center on St. John's that we asked? We, I don't think they need it because the first one we had it. They were supposed to do it on that one too, though. I'd have to check with Onesh. The because first one did. I mean, we. Yeah, it's the same same attorney. So, well, I'm the same attorney. Yeah. So, anyway, Onesh, did we get a map from them? I don't think we requested them to plot the map. We did. Stop. You remember differently than we do because we didn't remember that. So we we did ask for the. There's a support which we did get. I also had reasons to not be fond of this one. Um, nothing really having to do with the applicant themselves, but that they were going through as a minority. And um, I just think that, that that the way that it was written was with an intention to assist black and brown people who historically have been jailed for marijuana to be able to get licenses, and that's not what I'm seeing yet. It has nothing to do with this applicant, so I can't take it out on them. My feeling is that if there's an illegal place there, we have an opportunity to replace it with a licensed one. I don't know why there's an expectation for new issues to arrive in the arise in the park or wherever well, else I, I, that I, are I, not happening already with an illegal place. Now right. there's going to be a legal one, so there should be improvement, if anything. That's my opinion. So. I also an update that uh, Zach and the office shared. Please note nearby businesses which have added their support, the Palace 380 Canal, Lucia 375, Fresh Food Super Deli 386, Limitless Gym 371, Nancy's Whiskey Pub 1 Lesnard. Hazelton declined to, uh, to opt on any comments on any cannabis application because their headquarters are located in Minnesota. And that's where the main part of the organization is run out of and they don't want to comment locally. That is the, the, the Betty Ford place. Um, also note, note that the applicant is listed 1435 on the queued ranking right now. The likelihood of the licensure is fairly low, but we still have to do the business of the board on us. Okay, does that answer more questions? Yes. All right, fantastic. All right. Accepting my admin to identify that this is also that there is the. I had, I I do not think we need to identify because we did not on the first one the because it's not relevant to OCM. They do not care if it's near anything like that. It's not part of their rules and regs. There's no limitation on it. So while we may think it's important, it's not even a consideration that they'll take into account for. Uh, we will be adding in the parks comments that Alice brought up though. Okay, the question was called by Wendy, seconded by Justine. This is for a recommendation for approval and We're going to go by affirmation. Sorry, I lost my marbles for just a second. Um, do I have, and everybody's online, there's no one new. Great. Um, are there any opposed? Okay, so because we have to do this orally, 
handing mics around. Out. Blank, no, opposed. Airman, opposed. Chang, opposed. <laughs> Lerner, opposed. Grayson, no. <clears throat> you opposed. Camera opposed. Totally opposed. Drew no. opposed. Okay, how Song many opposed? Hold on. How many opposed do we have? Just hang on a second. Joyce. Are there are there any other in opposition? Um, Tammy, I'm on line. I if I can vote, uh, you know I am not there tonight, and uh, I would oppose it as well. Morton, I just need you to say opposed, abstention, well, I, or yes. I oppose. When I raised my hand to comment, you didn't call on me, so I. Spoke up. You need to call when I call for vote. If you're online, you need to just orally call if you're not going to be a yes. All right. All right. So now we'll go with abstentions. Song abstains. Forsberg abstains. Star abstains. Star abstains. Brown Kennedy abstains. Foreman abstains. Curtis abstains. Okay. So, so everybody knows there's already one that we approved a month ago on this, which is fine. You choose to deny this applicant. That is the determination of the board. But remember, much like a licensing agreement, if for some reason their lottery number changes, we have said zero. We have said nothing about the hours. We have said nothing about anything and our, our vote has no change in merit and motion fails. Hold on, I think so. 17, we have 39. So that's 17, that's right. Yeah, holy smokes. 17, are you sure about that? I can. All right, let's do that. I'm just gonna confirm, Mimi's gonna confirm the abstentions and the, and the opposed. By last night. Oh, um, opposed is uh, blank, Airman, Chang, Lerner, Grayson, you, Cameron, Townley, Minsley, Joyce, and Jew. Is there anybody else who was in opposition who we missed? Abstentions that I have recorded is Verisong, Forsberg, Starr, Brown Kennedy, Corman, and Curtis. Anybody else? You're changing. Okay, Corman says yes. So he's no longer abstaining. So it still passes. Is there anybody online who has an abstention or an abs or no one or abstention that we missed? Okay, great. And there are any recusals in the room? None. Okay. No, we're we're kind of done it passed we're going to add all the comments in and that's fine um the next thing is we have a nominating committee that needs to be formed by the march meeting we've had two volunteers so far um elections come up fairly quickly so the announcement here is to ensure that we have a nominating committee that is set and in place by march does anybody have any questions you may serve on the nominating committee if you are not planning on running for an office. And if you would like to serve on the nominating committee, please email the office and Susan Cole, who has graciously volunteered to wrangle. Any questions? Awesome. Let's move on. Next committee. Okay, so that's uh, Waterfront Parks and Cultural. We discussed one item. And we had a lengthy discussion about Queen Elizabeth Garden, also known as the British Memorial Garden, at, and it's located at Hanover Square. Basically, we talked a lot about uh, impacts on the park that were negative 
and they included um, skateboarders doing a lot of damage to the benches. And that's particularly of note because the materials uh, for the benches are special slate and marble, so they don't have it on hand to make the repairs so readily. But they did take note, Therese Flores, regional park manager was there. And on behalf of the community, I should say that uh, Susan Cole and Joel Coppell, who both reside at Three Hanover, uh, were, were there and they uh, offered a lot of comments on it. There was also some uh, comments about need for repairs of the bollards because the trucks uh, sometimes do damage. Uh, the park does have a, a worker there five days a week, which is good, but uh, still not totally sufficient. Susan did suggest that uh, we consider a, a gate, a fence around the park. That would be something that would be uh, further discussed before we make such a recommendation. And she further uh, suggests that the park be closed at 10 p.m. so that that wouldn't continue to be a problem. So that was basically the nature of that discussion, and I'm sure we will have further discussion of it uh, in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We're going to do a switch on the um, agenda and do land use next because Alice and Laura are here and Alice is going to have to depart us early this evening. I can do it. Alice? I, I'm happy to do the resolution. Uh, Tammy, you ask whichever the two of you wants to do it. <laughs> I you thought I right. assumed I was going to do it if it was after 730. So I go ahead. All right. I guess I'm doing it. All right. Um, so oh, I do water straight. <laughs> Laura, can Alice do the report on Water Street text amendment review and then we do the resolution because she's got to run? Yeah, whatever you want to do. Perfect. Okay. Okay. This all came up because there, um, we're looking at many, many applications along Water Street. You all might remember the faithful Water Street text amendment. We're now looking at the actual reality of seeing some of these spaces now transferred from being you know, residential to uh, commercial to residential, and these spaces are changing. And one that I noted that um, we were very surprised to see was the over 14,000 square foot space under 77 Water Street, beautiful uh, arcade space that had been completely demolished, uh, unbeknownst to everyone, including evidently the Department of City Planning. And so this came up as an issue in the um, in the land use committee, which is what that resolution is about, which Laura will review. And I just want to make one edit on this is that um, in the last therefore be it resolved, it's not plus a modification, it should be privately owned public space modification. And basically we're looking to ask that in the future, any modifications for um, any privately owned public space modifications be that go directly to DOB, which is what the case, what happens with arcades from now on, get a review from the Department of City Planning. So in other words, the Department of City Planning looks not just at plazas, but they look at arcade modifications, whether they're infilled or not. And that's what this is about. And then in the Water Street Text Amendment, this was a review of um, uh, the, the, the text amendment and some of the problems that, you know, we begin to see. And we're not looking to reinvent the wheel or necessarily throw it out. There's plenty about it that might be good, but to tweak it, in order not to have problems like we see of a 14,000 square foot landscape uh, being destroyed. So um, we've asked uh, George Janes, who is a zoning specialist who we've met and our consultant to just review this with the committee and consider are there things that we might want to change here or tweak with the amendment now looking back to almost 10 years. So those are the two. I don't know if Laura, if you want to give more detail on the resolution and thanks. Uh, so no, Alice I mean, has to leave. So Laura, the mic is yours. No, you. I mean, Alice covered it. Are there any questions? Okay, so we can. I think we can just vote and move on. Uh, just uh, there. There was one hand up in the room, Laura. Oh, Justine has it. a question. Okay. Shut down, please. 
Sorry, sorry, Laura. Just just to confirm, if we vote in support of this um, resolution, we are voting um, to kind of close the loopholes, or asking that the loophole gets closed. What? Well, what we're asking for. So right now, if the plazas, the bonus plazas, if you do anything to them, any modifications have to go through city planning. Right. But there's also the arcades, which are also part of the bonus system. And for some reason, those, when they go through, you know, if a developer is modifying their arcade and it goes to DOB, DOP for some reason isn't letting city planning know. And when city, and so that means we usually don't know about it. And so this is to correct that, to add the arcades into that process and to remind uh, Everybody, the developers, city planning, D DOB, that you know both the plazas and arcades need to go through that process because they're privately owned public spaces that were created so that the developers could have more more you know building volume. Right. And so it's not no, fair. It's not fair that. You know, it's not fair to us that this research, this open space resource can be modified. That's in the public realm gets modified without us knowing about it. So that's the intent is to improve to improve the system so that we get better information when we need it to opine on what's going on with these spaces. That's perfect. Thank you. That clarified it for me. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. So shall we vote? Anybody want to call the question? Laura, you've called the question and okay. Justine second it. It'll be a vote and affirmation. So are there any opposed? Seeing no one in opposition online or in the room, are there any abstentions? Seeing none in the room, seeing none online, are there any recusals? Motion passes. Thank you so much. And Pat, the mic is yours at the podium. I got to give you got to give you a mic. Alice, thank you so much. Everybody say happy birthday to Alice's hubby. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> it's her it's her husband's birthday. Happy birthday, I David. To, okay. I have to say we should celebrate him because he supports the immense amount of work that Alice does for our board. So, happy birthday, David. Thank you. Okay, everyone knows that for years and years, quality of life every other month, we have DDC come in to report on all the infra infrastructure projects that are taking place in our community. And we thought, I thought at, at this point, 22 years later after 9-11, we would kind of be over, but no, we have more projects. So the projects that are ongoing at the moment are Nassau Street, Front Street, Greenwich Street, West Broadway, VC Street, South Street, and they're about to start Trinity Place. We have a couple of places in your neck of the woods where there are, are collapsed manholes, and they didn't find, DDC didn't find out about these manholes that were collapsed until they went in to try to start the project and found out that the manholes were collapsed. Now, that leads to the Con Ed part of this discussion. So Con Ed has to come in and do repair work, not only on the manholes, but there are other issues that Con Ed needs to come in and take care of before DTC can continue their projects. And we know Con Ed is busy, but they are delaying the projects that DDC needs to proceed with because they, they can't do anything until Con Ed comes in. So that is the uh, red that uh, quality of life would like to have passed, that we're asking that Con Ed work closer with DDC, that they also, they used to years ago, they used to come to the quality of life committee, a representative would come to the quality of life committee, so they could hear what projects were ongoing and hopefully coordinate their work with DDC. So I think we can take the reso first. Is everybody yeah. taking resos first? I have lots of questions and hands up. Okay. So. We're going to start with Bruce. Um, I'm going to give you the mic, and if you don't mind passing the mic to Jill. As you know, uh, Worth Street has been uh, had been under reconstruction since the crane collapse, all like seven years. And what's going on on West Broadway was part of that contract. DDC broke it out, I think, for to employ people and to to extend contracts. So so they ripped out 
the West Street area that you're talking about. It's been two years. There's no sense of how long it would take. My granddaughter, who's in her late teens, she said, I've never been to your house since I was a baby where there wasn't construction outside. Do you did they give you an update on on West Broadway between Leonard and no, come on, that's not possible. Oh, whew. I thought you meant <laughs> it's actually it is possible historically. Twenty nine, and I'll have to check on it. It's on. It's on the tape. And on the collapse and the whole cover scheme that immediately. The collapse manhole cover that is at Warren and West Broadway, and there's one at DC and uh hilarious because they spent four years on Warren Street, as you know. We can talk. No, I, we talk okay. Next question, Jill. Yeah, so the three projects listed here, are these the ones with the bups manhole covers? Okay, because we say seven projects and then we list three. Yeah, because remember we asked them to send mm -hmm. us the bullet points of the three. But those are the yeah, three they sorry, yes, pass the mic back. Before. Pass the mic back. Can you hear me? No, no I, oh, that's sorry. online. Oh, sorry, people online. So anyway, those three are the three we asked in the meeting for DDC to bullet, send us bullet points of the projects that were requiring Con Ed to come in before they could proceed. Those were the three that we that they sent us. We're not going to you know, write any others than the three that they sent. When they come back, we can discuss what's going on. But I think the most important thing is to get a Con Ed representative to come to yeah. our meeting every other month so that they can coordinate in front of us with DDC. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, can I suggest a friendly amendment? Sure. That before you list those projects, just to add some um, context, is to say something along the lines of the the decrepit state of many of Con Ed's manholes require their specialty crews. Well, I had put in the man, I had put in the issue about the manhole covers. We took it out because they did not uh DDC did not come back to us specifically okay. to talk about the manholes. All right. So let's okay. not put it in there. We will stay on it. We are well aware yeah. that the it's this yeah, yeah, it's the specialty crews can take four months to arrive. So the projects put on hold for four months, costing taxpayers and everyone incredible money. And exactly. so it's and because Con Ed does not have enough for the specialty crews. And because downtown, so many of these are over a hundred years old, they're manholes. So and if you're if you're it's not like addressed the members of the committee, we're all kind of geeks and we like seeing photographs of when they open up the ground and we see this hundred year old water mains and <laughs> your conduits and we love seeing that stuff. So they they bring pictures to us for us to see. So you can go on to our YouTube uh, meeting and you can also see some of these. Yes. This link where <laughs> the Greenwich. on Greenwich Street, it feels like it's been years in the making. And and so it's a heavily trafficked area and they change like the crosswalks constantly and like there's rarely there's so, sometimes there's someone out stopping cars, but other times you risk walking right into the path of cars, especially like on. Um, um, we had a long talk about right by Whole Foods. So I, I would I would just hope that they would be you know that could be emphasized that there. Also, were. if you have specific issues, you know, tune into our meeting. You don't have to. You can do it online. Just come online, and while we're having the meeting, it's every other month. So we met this month. So next month they won't be there, but the following month they will be. And you know, tell them your complaints. Tell them what's going on. But also hear what because a lot of the committee members live in different parts of our community. Right. So we have a good a good good cross section of the community and we get you know, the, the we are not shy <laughs> anybody online questions okay so can we second all seconded i had not finished so <laughs> <laughs> The questions went faster than I thought. All right. So the question was called. The question was seconded. We'll do this again by affirmation. Assuming everybody's yes. Are there any abstentions? Are there any opposition? 
Seeing none online, seeing none in the room. Okay. No abstentions. Other... Motion passes unanimously. Sorry. The other piece of business that we could not vote on because we really didn't understand it is the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is trying to, we think, trying to update the rules for non smoking in restaurants and outdoor dining. But we had lots of questions and we didn't quite understand. We think what they're trying to do is closing loopholes that there might exist that might exist in the rules that exist now for non smoking in restaurants and outdoor dining. But we were very confused about it and we couldn't get clarity for uh, to, to write a reso. So there is a public hearing on March 14th. I think it's gone in our newsletter. Yeah, or is it too late for our newsletter? All right, so it's March 14th, Thursday, March 14th. The public hearing will take place from 10 a.m. until 12 p.m. on Thursday, March 14th. The hearing will be conducted by video conference accessible via internet or telephone. And we can give you this information if you want it. I don't have to read it. We can't, we just, yeah. okay, great. I think that's it for me, the other, Unfortunately, we couldn't get the first precinct there this month. Hopefully they'll come next month. So there are uh, any questions that there are. I can't think of anything. So that's me. Oh, did you have some Mary Amma, you have something? I just wanted to um, also add that a piece that was particularly unclear about that law was whether or not businesses that rely on smoking like hookah lounges and cigar bars would be adversely impacted by us voting yes, like they would be forced out of business. And so that was why we didn't want to approach it, even though it seems pretty simple. I'm gonna, I'm gonna also add that in association also with many rule changes that are coming um, because of the way that they work, we don't have necessarily enough time for a community board to opine based on the city timeline. So you'll see one count that regards to open dining and landmarks and landmark districts and buildings. Uh, we'll send that out and we'll send this one out. And I encourage everybody, don't need to wait for us. Go put your comments in online. Next committee. Right. Francis, thank you very much for Helping the food committee, Jason and I, the food committee. In the rain, she lugged over a bag full of food for us. And also, Jared has volunteered, but had an issue this month. So next month, Jared is going to help us. And if anyone else wants to volunteer to help get food, please, please do. Thank you. Just keep in mind that you also have to all volunteer to help clean up. All right, clean up. Everybody cleans up. Everybody helps break down. Okay, exactly. Next committee, please. Next slide. Fantastic. Be on. Thank you. And transportation is going to have simply two resolutions. Neither should be very contentious. So let's move forward with the next slide and look at our first. Item. And next, we'll go to the Trinity Place traffic study. Next, please. Yeah, for those who want to see the full the student's presentation, that was that link to go to it. But just to show, we all fit into the office, but you can see the students who are doing the presenting to the right, some of our youngest presenters, our new street advocates. Next. Yes, and it started out their presentation. And they, again, were looking at the various walking to get to the school PS 150 that they felt a lot of it was unsafe and were concerned about it. Next. As you can see, they, they were trying to document the, where the footsteps were versus where the people should have been walking in their mind if they used the crosswalks. Next. And so the students did go out and do counts literally on the corner. Next. And they. Uh, analyzed their data, they plotted, they analyzed it. Next, and presented it to us. You can see they, were, they put a lot of work into it. Next. And again, to remind everybody where the school is, it is in a difficult location, but there is a light 
by their corner, as you can see uh, on Trinity Place. There is not on Greenwich, but they were really talking only about Edgar and Trinity. But there was also a light over at Rector and Trinity. Next, now that you know where it is, I want to remind people too that this particular area does not have curb cuts everywhere which I've reminded people that accessibility is a real challenge in this area. And so the DOT is very much limited by that. They can't put a crosswalk where there is not a curb cut. So the resolution you're gonna see talks about a little bit more than just what the students brought up and a little bit differently because there are these various issues that are there. Next. So the Conclusion was, therefore be it resolved, the Manhattan Community Board 1 urges the New York City DOT to study the ways that people walk to from PS 150 across Trinity Place to the, to the east and across Greenwich Street to the west and create a street redesign plan that would calm traffic because they noticed uh, people speeding and allow all pedestrians to walk safely to the entrance of PS 150 using the most convenient ADA compliant route. I turn out over to you, Tammy. Mike's coming your way. Uh, this may be just an artifact of what was printed. But the printed version of the resume doesn't have that uh, ADA uh, reference at the end, which I think is a good reference. Uh, so I just want to make sure that whatever the official version of the resolution is. We will make sure that the last line after. Uh, it will, and it's going to be this one. Uh, I can tell you since I wrote both of them. The other one, I went back to the tape, and these words were not specified at the meeting before the vote. It was just in general. We're going to pick the most convenient, the, the best route. Study the, study the area and pick the best routes. Uh, this was being a little bit more precise so that it's not euphemisms. Yep. So we're gonna change where last line says using the most convenient and comma ADA compliant route. Right, it would be this wording. Gotcha, thank you, Jeff. Any other questions? I see no other questions in the room. Any questions online? Uh, it's been called and seconded. Thank you so much. We'll do a vote by affirmation. Are the, uh, everybody's a yes? Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Any recusals? Awesome. Thank you. Next. Yeah, now our second resolution. This was an easy month in terms of being straightforward. This again is the five borough bike tour, which we have we host at the start every single year. As you can see, this is the, this year's plan, and it is no different from last year's, except one thing, which you'll see. Uh, the only change is that there's a bike rental pickup for about, I think it's three or 4,000 of the uh, riders. They have to move from Battery Park City where they have been in the past, and you'll see on the map, it's kind of a white stripe with a green over there on, on I think it's Battery Place. But anyway, it's that area is too small and it's also being used as a staging area for the uh, resiliency project. So it's unavailable and it's also too small. Given the options that were being put forth by uh, Bike New York sponsoring this uh, borough tour, is the 10,000 square feet at Old Slip seemed to be the most convenient that was also liked by the members at the, of the committee. So that was favored and asked but the mayor makes the final decision and he has not yet approved the location. Hence it's mentioned in the resolution. Next. So therefore be it resolved, I wanna point out that since there are no real changes, we support approval of the bike uh, tour with the recommendation of the old slip be used as the location where bike rentals for unlimited biking are picked up. Again, they're dropped off in Staten Island at the end of the race. So we don't have anything to do with that in our district. The second portion of that MCB1 appreciates, gives a bunch of stipulations that are a repeat of last year, was very successful last year, and there were no complaints. We wanted to go on record again, asking for these same things. So again, if there are any questions. 
Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to ask the question. Any questions in the room? Seeing no questions in the room, seeing no questions online. And Ms. Kut, it's been called and seconded. We'll go, this is going great today, guys. Thank you. Um, is a vote by affirmation. Are there any opposed to this resolution? Seeing none in opposition, are there any abstentions? Seeing no one in abstaining, any recusals? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Betty, anything else? No, that's all. Thank you. All right, next committee. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Francis. <laughs> Hi. Um, at, when I was looking at uh, how to structure this report, it looked like it was going to be uh, less complicated than it is. Uh, we have part part A is about new legislation and um, changes in city laws. The first item is um, the Assembly Bill A eight four two seven A. Uh, you should have a copy of the proposed resolution that basically uh, supports what they're trying to do, which is only to change um, one small aspect of the law. It, it's very confusing because they, they use a lot of legalese stuff in, and the committee and myself did not understand <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that they were talking about. but. It's in the resolution, and uh, we had a a, a member. Um, <clears throat> her name is Leslie Clark. She graciously uh, from Q Up, which is uh, excuse me. Leslie's from Q Up. She's not a board member. She. It's okay. Keep going. Oh, okay. Um, so she put this together for us, and uh, like to get uh, uh, take a vote on this one, this resolution. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? I already have two. I knew that was coming. Okay, so uh, no, you're you're one and then Jess is the other. So I'm passing the mic to you. You probably can explain it better than me. clear and understand it. Basically, this resolution is saying we don't like this uh, bill because we think that it's um, had legal flaws and potential harmful impact. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Jess, good problem. Jess. Yeah, so um, Tammy, we spoke about this earlier. Um, I'm a I'm a bit confused by this resolution. Uh, I I took a look at the proposal, and all it does is remove one of several conditions before you can obtain a temporary retail permit. I, I think that requirement is the existing requirement that they want to remove that there had to have been uh, an active license for two years at that location. They all this does is remove that. Um, so I don't think a lot of this is an accurate portrayal of the legislation, it does not create a new and expedited process. Um, the part about the 500 foot hearing is is already true. It does not change anything about that hearing or anything about the process. Um, so I think this raises valid concerns. I'm not passing judgment on the on the validity of the concerns. I'm just I just I think this is a little bit. For lack of a better word, illusory and that we're channeling concerns through something that doesn't address those concerns. Um, so I would suggest that this be tabled and reconsidered because I, I really, I think this, this categorize, mischaracterizes the legislation and is not an appropriate venue to raise these concerns. So that's my suggestion. I'm not going to push through the hassle of a motion, but it's just my suggestion. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. I'll, mm -hmm. okay. You are the chair. No, I, absolutely. I'm just saying that I don't think this legislation says what we're saying it says. So, yeah, 
That's it's. Okay, this is a roll call vote to table. Hold on, I'm still trying to make a column. Column to the left. I'm doing. All right. Is the there any more questions, though? Or seconded. Oh. So we have to take the vote on the table. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes, the committee takes it off the table, and then and then it they can do what they wish. Yes, ma'am. No, because the motion was made and the motion was second. And so we're going to do it. I think we have enough people that we can do it by affirmation. If everybody's paying attention, including the back of the room. Intent. All right. So this is a motion to table. We're going to take this uh, an affirmation. If you are opposed to table. Raise your hand and I'll go around. Oh, shit. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Motion to so opposing the motion to table. I'm going to go around the room. I think I can probably just make life a little easier and. You are opposing tabling, meaning you want, you don't want to send it back to committee. You want to vote tonight. So. Meltzer opposed. Airman opposed. You want to do roll call? Because that's like easier. Because otherwise, I don't have to scroll up and down. I hate scrolling up and down. It's just the worst. Green. Brown Kennedy. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes to table. She would like to table it to talk about it later. Cameron. Thank you. Cassell. Thank you. Chang. Thank you, Chapman. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Charcutian. Yes. Thank you. Coleman. Yeah, yes. Gorman. Thank you. Kucha. Thank you, Curtis. No. Thank you, Airman. Thank you, Flores. Thank you, Flynn. No, Forsberg. No, Friedman. No, Broman. Galloway. Goldstein. Yes. Good kind. Grayson. James. James Mack. Thank you. Joyce. Yes, yes. Thank you. Ju. Thank you. Kay. Hey, yes. Thank you. Lerner. Joe. We'll get back to you. Just break in whenever you get on mute. Lion. Learner, yes. Learner, yes. Thank you. Lion. Thanks. Melter. Thanks. Minsley. A noted table. Thank you. More. Thank you. Pandia. Thank you. Portia Corey. Thank you. Robinson. Thank you. Rossi. Thank you. Sheer. Thank you. Star. Yes. Thank you. Jimmy Sung. Thank you. Verisung. Thank you. Townley. 
Thank you. You. Thank you. Seltzer. Thanks. And we have, oh, ah, uh, hold on. We're counting, please stand by. We are not tabling, so vote goes forward. Motion to table is found. Okay. But, oh, oh, the question's been called and seconded. So let's try this again. What was the, uh, Rich, Richard, you have to have a mic to talk because I can't hear you. I can repeat it. So the question was, what was the response to what Jess, uh, to what Jess had said? Um, there was a discussion about it. Let's see if I can find uh, some kind of an answer. Uh, yeah, I would be impressed if I did too. <laughs> Ooh, um, yeah. Here, let me see if I can find it. Yes. It was Leslie from Q up. She was asking about, uh, just like for instance, it was so compelling, but I can't really describe what it was because it was really intricate. But do you, does anybody have the, like, she said she was going to send the letter into the board, which answered everything about this, which was basically why we don't have hardware stores and other small businesses. It was presented, it was presented in committee, all, all the details. So it is in here. Um, I can read some of the from the committee itself because these were things that were sent and discussed directly in committee. So I'm happy to go over that for everybody. Um, it appears the major cr critical differences in the new proposed law and the current law and accompanying SLA guidance is that previously unlicensed spaces are now eligible for temporary OP licenses at, only after the applicant has received public positive public interest ruling from a 500 foot administrative law judge or ALJ. So it's a quicker licensing capability that bill pre opens up previously unlicensed spaces that can now go directly to full op licensing all right so it would appear that the requirement they're basically it's a two they allow them to be open two years it would appear that the requirement of finding a public interest by a 500 foot administrative law judge is a prerequisite to a new temp op license might might give the community a chance to mount um, concerns and applications to a new license in a previously unlicensed space but since the foil process is so slow the community may not know what the alj report says until that location is already qualified for and been issued a temporary license under the new law, it is possible that a temporary license for a previously unlicensed space could be issued before the SLA full board hearing is conducted, thus putting the community in opposition to a business that has already started operating under the temporary license. Although the bill's sponsors are pointing to the better hours for the community benefit that are offered under the temporary license, midnight, seven nights a week, 10 p.m. outdoors, four days, 11 p.m. outdoors, three days, these hours are already part of the current law, and those, quote, better hours only last during the temporary license. So the timing could go like this. A positive ALJ report is issued. Temporary license is issued with the, quote, better hours. Then the SLA full board hearing is held, and those better terms can be either made better for the applicant 
or changed later and perhaps worse for the community. Right. You need your mic. You need a mic. Where's your mic? Can I can I say something? Okay. No, wait. I'm I'm not I'm not done reading her note. You asked me to read the whole note. Here I am. All right. So the better hours and terms that are offered on the temporary SLA license conflict with DOT open restaurant rules and regulations. For example, a temporary SLA license says no music outdoors while the city's zoning text amendment allows fully open facades at all times of operation. Would the SLA assert its own licensing and enforcement powers over DOT's open restaurant rules? They have not done so yet. Example, service of alcohol across a bike lane is expressly forbidden by state law and the SLA and has never been enforced in spite of repeated attempts by uh, communities in CP1, 2, and 3 to do so. The latest expansion of temporary licensing procedures is a steady uh, push towards making it easier for restaurant and bars to get up and operating quickly. In 2021, Senator Ramos sponsored Chapter 700 2021, which allowed temporary beer and wine licenses previously only available to cities under 1 million to be extended into New York City. In 22, Senator Ramos co-sponsored uh, Chapter 106 of 22, which allows temporary OP licenses in New York City, but only if the location had been licensed in the past two years. So a temporary license could be for if there is an operating bar or restaurant, then somebody could get a temporary one for the next one if it closed. Now, Senator Ramos is sponsoring this new bill, along with Harvey Epstein, that allows temporary licenses in locations that have not been licensed before in the past two years. Um, each one of the measures has reduced the amount of public participation in licensing, making it easier for landlords to rent to bars rather than laundromats, laundromats toy stores, hat shops, daycare centers, locksmiths, et cetera, et cetera, for community benefit. Okay. So, so this, these are the notes that they said. I'm going to add my one comment that Jess and I talked about. My concern and the concern that we have consistently come back to in Community Board 1 is we want to support restaurants, we want to support bars, we want active nightlife. But one of the conversations comes is event spaces. This would cover event spaces in previously unlicensed locations. So we could lose a supermarket and have it turn into a club or an event space. And the community has not had the opportunity to talk to them about hours, traffic, cars, all the things that on the historic street grid that we have are nigh impossible to deal with. And that is one of the reasons why we're the committee said in previously unlicensed spaces, which are new spaces, it wasn't as favorable. I understand and that. And again, that's why I said I'm not passing judgment on the substance of the concerns. What I'm saying is the legislation doesn't deal with 90% of what you just said. The only thing it deals with is that one condition of, about the unlicensed places, which this resolution doesn't even mention. It talks all about a new process, uh, the changing the uh, 500 foot hearing with the administrative law judge. The legislation doesn't change that. That is all in existing law. All it does is remove one condition for receiving a temporary license, and it doesn't. This resolution doesn't address that. So that's why my suggestion is to take it back and write a resolution that more appropriately addresses these concerns. I understand, that, but I'm just. Yeah, I, I. Another reason that we supported this was because there were examples previously of establishments having been closed. And it also came up in committee that the prior legislation, um, Harvey Epstein actually opposed it for these reasons. And there was evidence of that that was presented in committee and now it's been rewritten pretty much identically and suddenly he's a co-sponsor and we didn't understand why because it's caught in the same harm as it was the first time. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
I, I have to somewhat agree with Jess. It doesn't really matter what the law says because it's not reflected in this resolution. I can only vote on the resolution. It is very ineffective. I don't think it all says what people think it says. Who probably went to the committee meeting and are convinced it says something that they got out of the meeting. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to vote it down because it's just plain is not something I would want to move forward. And I think it's gonna be incredibly in ineffective, even if it does passes. So I wish they would withdraw and, and make it more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, Francis, it's coming back to you. You've heard all the comments. Is there clarifying language that you want to put in about saying that we if the concern was in the committee that you didn't want to support the legislation because it is in it's supporting in previously unlicensed locations, then that needs to be clearer in the resolution and the therefore be it resolved. Is that what committee you talked about? Accept a friendly amendment. That's there. There you go. There's your clarification. Jeff. Uh, While we were arguing about this, um, or while Jess was speaking, I, I did take a look at the legislation. He is, in fact, correct. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that. I mean, there are valid concerns about this issue, um, but I don't think the resolution ac accurately refle uh, reflects the legislation or the best way to deal with the concern. So I, it's it's not a matter of just making a friendly amendment. It's like Jess says, the committee should go back and look at it and rewrite the resolution, which is probably very much something we would all want to support, but 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 I'm not going to vote in favor of this particular resolution. I think there's time constraints. I think what? there's time constraints because I think the deadline is March 15th and we meet the 14th. So the question is adding in that the CB does not support licensing in previously unlicensed locations without community board review, which is. Yeah, and for, yep. Okay. A pharmacy to a bar without the community having input. All right. So that's the last, therefore, be it resolved is that uh, community board one does not approve of including previously unlicensed locations for temporary liquor licenses without community board review. Correct? All right. Any other hands up or any other things? I can't call the question, folks. Ah, so the question's been called and seconded. Thank you. With the current <laughs> With the current um, with the current language as the final therefore be resolved, we're going to go by affirmation. If you are opposed to this resolution, please raise your hand. Coleman opposes. Uh, I'm only doing opposition so far. Coleman opposes. Anybody online for opposition? K opposes. K opposes. Thank you. Not seeing any more opposition. Are there abstentions? Okay. Okay. Slow, slow my roll. Okay. Chang abstained. Hooch abstained. Galloway abstained. Brown Kennedy and Cassell both have abstained. Who's in the who's behind Megan? Poshikori abstains. Cody abs, uh Lyons abstains. Rossi abstains. Sheriff abstains. Zelder and Forsberg. If with all the abstentions, the motion will fail. No, it won't. Never mind. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody else. <laughs> motion passes. Thank you. All right, Francis. Okay, the next item that we discussed was uh, <clears throat> oops. number two, DCWP. They proposed a repeal of the rules regulating relating to uh, sidewalk cafes. And basically, uh, it's about the process. Um, 
they want to review the process. Now, uh, the process is, is that you file an application, it takes five days, and then it's sent to the community board. And after that, the community board gets to review it, then the review, they, have, it's, they get 40 days, and yes, no, abstention or a stipulation, and then uh, it goes back to the uh, department for review and they get 20 days. So it's, pro it's process back and forth, back and forth to the, to the, to, until it gets to the, <clears throat> to the final uh, chapter. So basically that's what, <clears throat> what they're, they're asked that they're going to pursue and they're going to make the move change. Um, they're having a hearing to propose that. But hearing is. We can send that out. Don't worry about it. We'll send it out with the notices of all yeah. the rule changes. The notice of public hearing. Okay. Yep. You've got an update from 18 William Street, 20 exchange. Submersive. Um, basically, they are not going to do the full opening until April. They're going to uh, right now. They're just going to open the cafe. And then kind of come back to the committee before they do the final opening. Um, okay. License. Okay. How are we doing? Two, How are you doing on Tribeca area? 293 Turk Street. Can we take these together by any chance? No, because there's a. Uh, actually, we can take. Okay, so we're taking 293 church by itself. We can take uh, 293 church, 100 church, 78 Leonard. Hold on. Okay, so we're taking all three for Tribeca together, correct? Yes. Okay. Taking all three for Tribeca together, 293 Church, 100 Church, and 78 Leonard. Are there any questions in the room for those? I have one more comment to make about Uh-oh, go, 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 go. Yeah. Um, what we didn't put in, in the resolution is that, that these are all uh, the line about large venues, large venue stipulations. They're all large venues. So they, two of them are large. Uh, 100 church and 78 Leonard. So we usually have a, a line in there that says, you know, um, but yeah. and we discussed it, but it was not, and I didn't get a chance to review it and we didn't put it in and that's. But do you want to be, Justine, stop. Do you want to, do you want to be adding that in? Is that what you're trying yeah. to say that the large venue stipulation should, should be, be added? Into those. Okay. To those two. So that's fine. Great. Got it. Um, are there. So taking taking the three together, are there any? I asked for any questions first before you guys. I appreciate where you're going. Uh, I do appreciate that. Any other any questions around the table? I wanted to know why on 293 Church there was opposition. Does anybody remember? Nope. Not yet. Okay. Without without knowing, I think I can still roll. All right. So, <laughs> taking all of Tribeca together for a vote for affirmation. Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Abstentions. I don't know what happened to that. Are there any recusals? All right. So, all of the liquor license uh, resolutions for Tribeca have passed unanimously. Okay. Now I'm asking to take one in Seaport, the 214 Front Street, together with uh, 164 Pearl Street in the Financial District. And again, uh, yeah. So 164 Pearl. Guys, keep it, keep it, keep the chatter down. Don't make me use the gavel, please. Uh, 164 Pearl and 214 Front. Are we taking 206 West as well? No. No. Okay, so that's two. Seaport and FIDI number one are coming together. Going by affirmation, do I have any opposition? Oh, wait, did somebody call the question? And second, fantastic. Do I have any opposed? 
Any abstain? No recusals. Those two pass unanimously. Okay, Battery Park City, 206 West Street, a.k.a. 200 Chambers. Okay. Um. <clears throat> I I agree with you. I know I hold on a second. Jason, come back. You're just don't talk to Bruce. Okay. <laughs> Francis, you're on. And you gotta talk nice and loud, otherwise Bruce is gonna talk okay, over you. One, uh we have to add the large venue stipulation to it, but I have another comment about this particular uh approval. They were uh, in the uh, resolution, you'll see that they were supposed to bring a letter back to us because they had presented to us before and the community was not having it. They were there in force. And so they came, they, when they came this time, supposedly the community was back, was 100% behind them. So we said, okay, if that's what's happened, we, we need some proof from the, uh, from the board, you know, stating that they support you. And they sent the letter that they sent is not, I don't think it's adequate. Yes. They came before us. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's pass a mic around because otherwise all the people online here is. So part of the application um, packet is that they have to get a petition signed by people in the immediate area saying that the community members support this establishment getting a liquor license. They did not have one and they were kind of adamant about not getting one because instead to move things along, they've taken it upon themselves to talk to the, the co-op board of the one building that is adjacent, which, I mean, that makes sense, but they didn't get anything in writing from that co-op board. So it was just like hearsay, like, oh, the co-op board loves us, go ahead and give us a license. And we said, no, you produce either a letter from them or the petition that we ask of everyone by the meeting. And then we gave, then they asked if we could extend that and we gave them until the March meeting to produce it. No, until this meeting. So this oh, was the yeah, until, yeah, until this time. time. Oh, okay. Which they did. Time. And I'm okay. telling you that it's it's not acceptable. Oh well they have to find it. Okay. Can you put it up on the screen? Yep, please? it's going up on the screen. This is what we received. Francis look. What? It's 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 literally one line from the board of where the signature is was not typed in. We were expecting a little bit more. Yeah, but that didn't come up. Private. They have a right. The outdoor seating is on private property. Therefore, it doesn't have any kind of outdoor dining. They have no special request for anything. It's by landlord. Uh, Mike to Jeff. Is this the nightclub operator that has a similar that, that was looking at that space before? Oh, it's an entirely different set of people. Well, this guy has some some places up in Westchester, but that has nothing to do with this. Oh, right, this is a different person. It's, right. it's, it's not the one that generated all that community office. No, no, no. Do we have any reason to believe that the community opposes this, or are we basing it on the prior operator? I see. Yeah, every packet you're supposed to have community. 
And their lawyer, if they had one, was this someone experienced in this? Oh, no, he wasn't inexperienced. <laughs> Somebody we know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we spoke to them, and uh, you can take my word. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, Mike, I'm sorry. The verbatim, the lawyer said, and he's, he's the lawyer that, that does a lot of these things at our meetings. He said, we spoke to them. Take my word for it. I have no reason to lie. And yes. it was it was exactly what he said. Yeah. Then we brought up, we kind of joke says, you know, Judge Judy would say that's hearsay. We trust you. We have no reason not to believe you, but we'd like something in writing. We need some for and the record. So now it seems a little disingenuous. The first applicant, everybody came out in arms. They didn't want it. The second applicant, no community people opposed it. We have no reason to believe that anybody in the community does not want this. I live across the street. They came out. They got signatures. I don't understand what the issue is. Oh. I agree with that. You know, our, we're in we're in that building, and uh, but I don't want to push aside protocol I didn't realize that every application has to have a signed list of people to get a liquor license support is that been our way for many years yes. so if that so like if I don't fill out an application right for whatever I do it doesn't get approved so if if they didn't submit the proper paperwork I'm sort of bewildered why they didn't. It was it a lawyer for the building or for the land for the landlord or for the for the, the applicant, and he did not he complete, better. He did not complete the application properly. Exactly. So I'm sort of I, I agree that there's no opposition to it. I oppose it because it's only a meat eating. Fifty years we're going to look at eating meat the same way we do with smoking. It's over all you can eat meat, um, but, but that's besides that's just me going off on a tangent. Okay, wait a second, Tammy. Hold on, hold on. So the remedy is a remedy to. I make one joke, and now everyone wants to kick me off, right? Uh, everybody's talking all day long. Is the remedy to table this would that be? No, I'm gonna vote. Uh, Right. Okay, you don't have it today by by the full board meeting. So that was already an extension that none of the other applicants received. They all had theirs at committee. Bruce has the last word, and then Wendy has called the question after that. So I just want to say I, I don't understand this. It's like a committee meeting on one resolution. They didn't. This is they, it. Shouldn't even gone before the committee. The answer is no. Okay, it's been called. It's been seconded. Let's vote. We are voting to oppose unless, like a normal application, unless they comply with the subject. Perfect. Normal application. Everybody's going to be in the affirmative. If you are opposed, please raise your hand. Okay. The resolution. No, it's not. It's not. We are opposing this to support what they're getting a little. It's unless they comply with the limitations and conditions set forth above. It is a normal, a normal vote. So again, this is. If you are opposed to the resolution, please raise your hand. Yes, yes, it is a regular liquor license that opposes unless right and what they said we can complies with the limitations and conditions set forth above. That is how we do it. So, yes, they would get their license with the stipulations that we have laid out. Okay, if you oppose them getting the license with the stipulations as we have it laid out in here, then you are opposed to the resolution. Does that make that nice and clear? If
It's been called, it's been seconded. It's a vote by affirmation. Are there any opposed? Opposed to the resolution, which means. Okay. Yeah. You guys are opposed to. Oh, stop. Stop talking. Thank you. We can't actually do the business if everybody's just yelling across the table. Again, you are opposed to the resolution as written. And keep in mind, as Susan Cole says, if you oppose the resolution, then it goes to the SLA. We have no, no vote, no nothing. Okay. In opposition. Airman, are you opposed? Voting the way it's Airman, yes or no? I'm confused now. Sorry. We'll come back. <laughs> are opposed because the applicant refused to complete the application. But that is so we'd still be making a comment. So if you vote for the resolution, you are supporting. You're basically saying yes to this resolution says that if they don't comply with the limitations such as giving the signature and everything else, they are they should say yes to correct. correct. Like a regular so we like, say yes to the resolution, and then there, is there a clarifier to the SLA explaining that they did not complete the limit? Yes. Okay. Hey, hey, cut the crosstalk down. Please give that back to Francis. Our I think we would send them something since since this is the way it's going. Okay. You have to send Again, them something. If they are opposed to the resolution, raise your hand. Are you opposed to the resolution as written? No, no more clarifying questions. We're done because it was called. It was seconded. We're in the middle of a vote. We are trying to attempt to take the vote. It's it's getting like wily. I know people are hot and tired, but let's just come on. Pay attention. So, apologies. Okay. I see no oppositions in the room. Are there abstentions? Townley abstains. Zelter abstains. Seeing Rossi abstains. Are there any abstentions online? Hearing and seeing none, motion passes. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go. Next committee. Oh, and by the way, we have some lovely students here who are observing us tonight. So, yeah. You're next. You're next. Take the mic. You're there. I can't wait for them to talk to all of you. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Uh, we had a busy two resolutions. Um, hmm. It's not me. Maybe you think education. Oh. Yeah, I was. I'm very confused. Are we on Y and E? No, we're on landmarks, okay. and then you. Carry on. So we're going to do landmarks. We just need to make some progress with something that's not uh, that has pretty pictures. I'll just put it that way. Okay, go, Jason. Okay, so we had uh, the great um, original uh, Bank of America building, uh, 108 Leonard, and uh, it's an interior landmark. And uh, one of the gallerists around these days has now. Uh, Purchased a condominium, uh, quite a big one, and um, this space happens to be an interior landmark. And the work that they're doing to them to the interior seems appropriate. Um, and uh, the only thing caveat was that uh, way back in 2000 something, when the building was transferred from the city to a developer, there was a deed restriction for some public space. And it's questionable whether that public space is within the envelope of this condominium. Um, so as long as it's not, and there are exclusive spaces to each other, then we, as a committee, um, recommend an approval and also didn't see anything wrong with these interventions that were being made on a preservation purpose level. So if anyone has anything to say about that design that, you know, Bruce, go. 
I just want to say that downtown television workshop, which is fundamental to our neighborhood, their historic nonprofit, was to have gotten space and will get space. And it turns out, because I've checked it since the resolution, a considerable amount of their space is above ground adjacent to this space, it turns out, and some of it is below ground. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity by an incredible gallerist to give back to the neighborhood what was lost when the clock tower portion of this building, which held the, the famous clock tower gallery, uh, was was privatized and it went all the way to the uh, New York State Court of Appeals and we lost. So an interior space, which is supposed to be open to the public, an interior designated space, the clock tower was privatized and appended to a $30 million uh, penthouse, and now we're getting 20,000 square feet of landmarked space back to the neighborhood, open to public view and by a great, great gallery. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity. I concur. And just to be perfectly clear, the applicant sent a note to the community board that said about the one wait Leonard is that the provisions of community facility and a media center were included in the deed when the city sold the property to the developer. It was not part of the LPC permit aside from being shown on floor plan plans as part of the overall project. The 2013 deed shows the community facility space in its current location on the ground floor, which is not part of the space acquired by the gallery or any part of this current application. So that should be fairly clear for all of us. Okay, and then the other one was a South Street uh, seaport, um, pretty thoughtful reconstruction of what was a four story um, early, not even 20 foot wide, um, you know, mercantile uh, building. And so we all thought it was well done, and uh, the resolution um, is a, approve, a resolution to approve. Do we have any questions from anybody in the room or anybody online? Seeing no questions, does anybody want? Second. Called and second, taken together, we'll do a vote by affirmation. Are there any opposed to these two applications? Sheer. Sheer opposes 110 South Street. Any other oppositions? Anybody online? Seeing none, are there any, any abstentions? Hearing and seeing none, are there any recusals? Hearing and seeing none, motion passes. You Thank you very much. Tricia, it's 8.52, and so I'm going to ask you to give no more than a five-minute report because we have the resolutions following you afterwards, and there are... Four resolutions. Um, okay, I don't think it's going to take that long anyway. We have no resolutions. I we had. Oops, sorry, I'm not visible. Um, we had a uh, discussion about the makerspace um, item that Joel brought to us, and we had a great conversation. We discussed possible funding streams. We found out that the city council um, actually can designate funds for something like this. I looked into that and we just have to have the space first before we can go for the money. So I am reaching out to the schools in lower Manhattan, uh, uh, Trinity Wall Street um, and DYCD. Um, as per Desi's suggestion, we're going to see if we can find some partners and go after the funding for this. It's going to be, I think, a really wonderful addition, um, if not at the school level, at the community level. So more to that soon. Um, we also had Peter Say from the Manhattan DA's office um, come visit us, and he uh, shared with us several programs that his office has for high school and college students. They are paid internships for the summer. They were excellent and interesting um, internships. One's a fellowship for college students on gun safety. Um, Lucy sent these out by blast right after our meeting, but anyone who'd like more information, just reach out to the office who has all the flyers and they can send them to you. Um, I was in touch with Peter yesterday. He's also going to be sending 
some more opportunities because the ones he had were mostly for kids. The college ones were only for kids that went to school in the city. Um, so he is looking into um, some additional ones. So it's a great resource for um, summer internships for our kids. So um, again, you know, reach out to Peter at the DA's office or the board to get those flyers. And that is it. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Tricia. Let's we're gonna go to the next committee. So it's housekeeping time at 854. We need to be out done with the meeting in 36 minutes, just so everybody knows, so we can clean up, break down, and be walking out this door sharp at 10 because those are the rules and regs of this space. So I ask there are really complicated resolutions ahead of you. The Environmental Protection Committee and the Battery Park City Committee did some super heavy lifting on this. So we're going to do which. So we're, we're going to let's figure out what you're going to go for. You know, we're going to go. We're going to go quickly because the North and West Battery Park City Resiliency Project. We have two resolutions: one on Reach Six which is South Esplanade, and another one is Reach 7, which is South Cove. I have a lovely set of slides here. I'm hoping everybody has read through the resolutions. The biggest thing that I, and, and I'm gonna ask now, if people have looked at it and they have questions, raise your hand now so I know if I go quick or slow. But next slide. Um, at the end of the day, the authority came in and presented the Battery Park City Committee uh, first, and then we came in and we, cleaned it up uh, at the beginning of February with the Environmental Protection Committee. So this is a collaboration of both committees. The authority came in and presented that that's what they heard from um, their walkthroughs and their community meetings at Stuyvesant High School. So number one, it was really great that they heard something, they heard anything, and we were agreeing with a lot of what they heard, but we also had a chance to look at it, discuss with them, and challenge some of their interpretations. So they heard it, but then we said, yeah, but. So um, in our resolution, we addressed the yeah, buts. Next slide. Okay, so I'm not gonna do this. Part of what we didn't like, next slide. Just keep going kind of quickly. This is, this is the, Espl the Esplanade Plaza by the volleyball court. That's showing you the wall there, next slide. What we did not like was this. We don't mind the wall in the background we just showed, but they are severely encroaching on the public open space that was really important to the folks in that Park City Committee and the Environmental Committee agreed with it. So what we're saying is, yes, we want to preserve as many, preserve as many trees as possible, but we do not want to have really valued public open space encroached upon with new trees. And that is a very different message from the North um, you know, North Battery Park City. So that's something to take into mind, and that's one of the things here. Next slide. There was cons uh, shows you. Just keep going. Uh, keep going. I don't know what the hell it is. Um, I do have to go closer. Sorry, I can't see it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm taking it with me. Don't worry. I can't see it. But um, we're with here. We talked about. Um, God help me. We're concerned about the uh, top of the wall. Keep going. Next slide. Okay, you and you jumped around way too fast. I'm going to just talk. Get leave the slide there. Let it sit. Um, all right. We were concerned about the art installations at the ends of Albany Street, uh, Rector Place, and West Thames Street. They don't know what they're going to do with them yet. They're going to have to move them. They're going to hope to preserve them or recreate them someplace else. But it's TBD. They don't know. Another thing they came up with was uh, street nodes. And again, look at this presentation. It should be on the Battery Park City Authority's website. It's important to see. Um, something that Zach pointed out. The street note is something that they've put in place over at, at um, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Really lovely for a big park that has lots of space between where you're going to be. Ends of the streets at West Thames Street, at Albany Street, and at um, uh, Liberty. All of these places, really small spaces. We do not want to have that space encroached upon with things that are going to be blocking Ingress and egress and transportation is a thoroughfare. Something else to tell you just importantly on it is that um, I just don't know where the slides are going to be to show you. Let's go. Let's see. So this is, oh, this is something that's important to note. Keep going. Next slide. Here, this was one really cool thing, the existing flood barrier plane. This is what they had proposed in their meetings. They were going to be blocking off this whole area. Next slide. Like this, this would have been a horrifying blockage necessary 
to protect us, but horrifying. They listened to us and they came back with this, which is so nice. And in between will be um, deployable flood barriers. So that's like a really big win. And thank you to the Battery Property Authority team for coming up with an alternative. Next slide. Okay, condominium, okay. This is, just stay right here for a minute, okay? We have six, we're not gonna talk about it. Anyways, anybody have any questions about that? Because we talk about all these things, we make mentions of it, we, we, we address the areas where we had concerns about what they interpreted, and then we came back with them and gave them feedback and input as to what we wanted instead. And they were very receptive, they were very, very appreciative, and they were very um, glad to hear from us. One of the things that our esteemed chair pointed out and noted was that throughout their designs, um, they had concrete benches that they're putting in place. So they're gonna be putting in plantings and they're gonna be putting built-in concrete benches as part of the plantings. We asked if that was part of the resiliency measure or this was just their design. They said it was design. So we said, thank you, but not. We prefer if they reuse and repurpose the existing wind slot benches. Jeff, you called them world fair benches. I'm assuming that's a thing. So, okay. But the ones that sit there now, okay. We like them. They're cooler. They're better. They, okay. Hurry up. Okay. We're, we're just about done. Anyway. Okay. If anybody has any questions on reach six, let's vote. Go ahead. Jess. Yeah, come up here. If you've got a question, just come up. It's easier to stand in one place. Do you know um, how the flood barrier wall that they're putting along like gateway and the rest of the buildings along the esplanade, how that compares in height to the existing privacy wall? It's it's going to be taller by a few feet. What they're going to have to do, and I have a slide, but I don't, just don't know what it is, and I'm not going to waste time looking for it. It's going to be a little bit taller, depending where we are. Okay. Uh, Jess, I know why you're asking that question. I asked the question for the same reason. Um, they're very conscious that every inch of that privacy wall has the potential for affecting the view on the other side of that wall. And there are apartments in certain areas. There are commercial establishments in certain areas. One of the things that they are looking into is changing the top of the wall into a curved surface, which for some sort of hydrodynamic reasons allows them to build the wall not as tall but give the same uh, opposition to uh, a protection from uh, wave action. Um, they're not certain they can use it. They're hoping they will. And if they do, the new wall may not be any taller than the existing wall in a number of places. But they're sensitive to that issue, Jess. They, they don't have a definitive answer yet, but they're sensitive to that. And, and we comment on that in the resolution, and we, ur we urge that. Thank you, Jeff. I was getting to it really slowly, but um, the, the, the point is that they've got this cursed top wall that they say is going to be able to hopefully, well, they think they're putting it here on Gateway Plaza, and we've asked them to consider putting it all along, uh, all every place where they're going to put it against the buildings. But with the curved wall, it allows them to reduce the height of the wall, still provide the same flood barrier protection. So that's, you know, science, yay. Um, okay, so there's that. Any other questions? Oh, one other thing I really want to point out is what they said was all throughout the South Esplanade along the, there, they are not touching the, for the most part, they are not touching the area from the water to that first barrier. So, Onej, I'm going to come look. I'm going to come. People can absolutely listen to the meeting to see it. Let's okay. focus on the resolution. We are. So they're not touching this. They are touching this, and that's really the important factor. So, so you know, can we take a vote? Anyone want to call a question? The... All right, let's do it. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Assuming affirmation, are there any opposed? Seeing no in opposition in the room, are there any opposition online? Seeing no opposition online, are there any abstentions or recusals? I abstain. Who is I? Laura Starr. Laura Starr abstains. Yep. Westbrook recuses. Okay. Motion passes. Moving on. Which is South Cove. And I'm going to go here quick, two minutes worth of stuff. Bottom line here, the biggest area of concern is the pergola. Okay, so we'll just talk about that. The address, the, the, the resolution addresses that. Um, 
they talk about what we want and yes we want the forest walk field blah 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 we talk about the seeding next slide so biggest area of concern is here the pergola is um and they came up with i believe three different options with one of them being as is the committee and the community unanimously said keep it as is um we didn't like the other two options you can look at the pictures if you could flip through as you go just keep going to the end um and just keep going and then um, at the end of the day that was our feeling that was our position the uh environmental protection committee agreed with our feelings about it all and we are on accord um i believe that we did state that along the along the area north sorry, east of the pergola, we would consider and be okay with having the cobblestones removed, but we do not want the dense foliage that they presented in one of the options because it blocks the views. And our biggest issue throughout reaches six and seven was preserving the views from the street, from the buildings and to the street. And the authority heard that and seemed to be doing it. So any questions on seven? Um, yeah, I'm just going to say I disagree with that. I mean, I think the foliage is really important for shade and for habitat. So, so, okay. so uh, Laura, can, I mean, that's okay. Point. Point taken. Thank you. And we don't not want foliage. We just don't want dense foliage that blocks views. But that was the vote of the community, the people that live there. And others who don't live there who were part of the community. That's true. Yeah, there were other people. Did, yes. Okay. So while Laura was talking, I heard the question called. Did I hear a second? Fantastic. So we're going by affirmation. Are there any, which means you're a yes. Is there any opposition? Yeah, I oppose. Star opposes. Are there any abstentions? Are there any recusals? Forsberg recuses. Fantastic. All right, motion passes. Next. And which one is the last one you're doing? Because we need to roll call it. Okay, I'll tell you which one's the last one. Uh, it's one of the two battery property ones, but Wendy has a report. Wendy, thank you so much for being our. Hi, everyone. It will be super fast. Uh, we just want to go over the battery, which um, was mentioned in the mayor's report earlier that evidently there's a walkthrough on March 6th. Um, it's a $200 million uh, budget. It is raising the edge along the south here by five feet. That is to combat sea level rise, but not storms, so not Hurricane Sandy. The idea is the park will flood. Uh, the, 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 I guess the, the good and the bad news is that they're starting the work uh, January 24 through July 2025. Uh, it's a 19 month project. Um, basically, the whole wharf is going to be inaccessible. Um, there are signs up already. Uh, just wanted to warn everyone, we're gonna go fast, but next slide. The, no, no, back one. And then July of, of 2025 to July of uh, 2026, basically 11 months. Um, they're going to be doing the project that you see here um, to finish it up, which, long story short, has a lot to do with moving uh, the ferries and that type of thing for to, uh, to go to the Statue of Liberty. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Uh, basically, I just want you to see it that it's right now you walk straight out and in the future you'll they'll walk up and they're going to have these nifty little cutbacks which will make the edge, which is a cantilever uh, load bearing. It will be easier to board vessels with this type of thing. And of course, um, Tammy and many others asked about emergency vehicles, so uh, mer emergency evacuation. So that's gonna be better as well. Next one. Okay, and then this is basically uh, the wayfinding signs. That's the big thing. So next slide we can find. And the communication, um, they have anything you need to find, just look it up. I don't want to take any time. Any questions? <laughs> okay, great. Wendy, thank you. That was really fast. All right, Battery Park City. So, okay. Hold on. So, thank you, Wendy. That closes the environmental. Now we're on just Battery Park City. Please note there are two resolutions. The last one will be roll call. Okay, so I'm going to go try to go quick. Let's just jump to the next slide, please. And let's go with the Battery Park City Committee's resolution in support of Senator Kavanaugh's bill that um, 
and buyers talked about a little bit earlier. It's basically to promote housing, next slide, housing affordability and stability for income eligible homeowners and renters whose primary residences are located in Battery Park City. So who, who is this, okay? Basically we're talking about people who are being protected by this bill. This bill says that people whose income eligible has to be less than 150 of AMI. This is the income ban. So you're protecting middle income people. Next slide. All right, so here it tells you who an eligible homeowner is. You have to be a primary resident. It has to be your owner occupied. Who's a, and the ground rent is the portion that they pay. Next slide. I mean, anybody has questions, I'll explain it. I'm going to go quick. Eligible renter is someone who lives in their rental unit, who is subject to a, a quasi rent stabilized unit, Gateway Plaza, or has a designated uh, regulatory agreement between the landlord of the building and the BPCA. I believe that's Trebekah Point or Trebekah Green, which one it is, and some other um, organizations, some other buildings like the Solaire and anything that was still has a holdover from 421A, they would be eligible. And again, they cannot make more than 150 AMI adjusted for household size. Same thing with the grounders, ground, uh, renter's ground rent, a little harder to figure out because it's not spelled out every month, but it is spelled out for the landlord. They know what they're paying in ground rent. So who does this affect and how many, what kind of income are you talking about, okay? One person household, you're talking about $148,000. Two people, one sixty nine five hundred. blah, 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 okay? And those people are here now. So who is it gonna be? What's gonna happen? You're gonna get a rebate of the portion of the ground rent equal the difference between what you're paying today in the base year, assuming today, whenever they decide the base year is, what it would be as it goes forward. Um, what's going to happen is the building's going to pay the ground rent, as always, you're going to pay your ground rent, and then you're going to get a rebate. So, so the, the rebate check goes, I mean it's a check, goes to the homeowner that's eligible, that applies, and goes to the renter. Next slide. So who is this going to affect, or allegedly, or who could be even possibly be eligible? So we looked at the census slides, and we looked at uh, the AMI chart, right? And it looks like it turns out that 38% of the owner-occupied housing units self-reported in Battery Park City had a household income of less than $150,000. That's not qualified by household size, okay? So even with that number, we saw that a one household was 148, whatever. Um, but potentially, as of 220, 2022 numbers, 509 out of 1,345 people in Battery Park City South who are Owners could possibly be eligible. Renter occupied units, it would be same kind of an idea, 1,000, blah, blah, blah. Justine, they can read. You got to keep going. Next slide. Nine, this is a copy of the you, you're, you're, that, That's Here's too much. That's, uh -uh. Too much. Here's information here. All of this is, is uh, contained and so consolidated into the resolution. But just so you know that this is there, this is again the slide, there's links to the, to the chart. And so basically the rationale is because of all the escalating costs, you know this, Jill talked about how expensive it is and how expensive to replace the purpose of this bill. Next slide. How many more slides do you have I before you keep going? And we're done. Therefore, be it resolved. That's what we say. We'd like the bill to be done. And that's okay, it. Okay, there's hands Questions. up. Please pass the mic to Jill. Jill first. I'm going to go to Mary because she's closer. And then I'll get to Jill. So I, I think I got the part about the owners. I just want to be clear about the renters. When you say the renters are also getting this benefit, because you talk mostly about yes. owners, is that like you're a condo owner and you're renting to someone? No. So you're a, you're a landlord essentially, and you're going to get this big benefit, and the renter may get something. You must be someone subject to. As I rent stabilization, which is only in Gateway Plaza, or having a contract with the, the landlord and the Battery Park City Authority. So, no, I rent my apartment out. I could not, I don't, I'm, it doesn't count. I don't have, I'm not, sub, I'm not subject to it. So, no, the renters, it would be, they're institutional landlords. And the way this is written, allegedly, I've talked about this now with Dan Byers and Governor Kavanaugh's office. This will not inure to the benefit of Gateway Plaza because that was some, or any landlord. It was something that was really intent upon because back in 2002, 2003, when people, the city was trying to encourage people to move back to Battery Park City, Lower Manhattan after 9-11, they gave these subsidies of $500 here, 250 there, and that just allowed the renters, the landlords to increase the rent. That should not happen. 
Um, I just want to say uh, strongly and um, uh, forcefully that including the renters in this resolution is disingenuous. The small amount of renters that would be eligible at Gateway Plaza might get $10 a month, $10. That would be their rebate. We don't know the amount, but it would be something like that. So the amount of benefit that goes to the homeowners is so far in excess of that, that it is my belief, my opinion, that including the renters in this reso is to add the appearance of affordability and stability. And I find that to be reprehensible. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. But part of why I did not want to rush through my numbers, Tammy, is because it's actually 35% of the renter occupied housing units in Battery Park City 10280, which is only Gateway Plaza, which means 1,000. That's not only Gateway. 10280 is the entire Southern. No, no, I'm saying, but of renters that are subject to quasi rent stabilization, it's Gateway. 1,028 out of 2,000. 948 that's 35 percent who could be eligible renters so it's not it's it, it it is not a lot of money once again because gateway plot okay, okay, is the okay 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 it's not do we have any i have another question that does not obviate the need and that some people could be using a benefit and it is a start this does not preserve affordability in gateway plaza or any place in in manhattan 915 um Can, does does this bill give parity to what's done outside of Battery Park is but is is there this program outside of Battery let's say in the rest of New York City do we have that same program and they just never had it in Battery Park it's a state program it's That's a state problem. program it is state it is only owned. relevant it's not a program yeah I, I just want to try to I, I do support this resolution Jill is right it doesn't really help the renters and I, I've told Kavanaugh, he should just take the renters out, but it does help middle income condo owners. The, the, the concept of it is a ground rent freeze for condo owners who meet the income qualifications. What that rebate does is that it basically, if, you, if your income falls below the 150 AMI, whatever your ground rent was that year, that's what it stays. Um, and I think, you know, it's a small step in favor of middle income affordability. It doesn't solve the housing problem, but it goes in the right direction, I think. And also things that you're not aware of that I, as, as renters, the ground rent for Gateway Plaza and large buildings, everybody in Battery Park City is facing fair market value resets, commercial buildings and residential buildings, both rent, both rental and condo owners. Okay, I'm going to Sorry, tell you. So call, it, it could question. be today. It's not a large Does amount. It could say? be a large amount in the future. Oh, I, I got one. <laughs> yeah. Call to question. Thanks. All right, All right. Do a vote. Okay, we're going to vote by affirmation. Are there any opposed to this? No. K is a no. Anybody in the room? Are there any abstentions? I abstain. It's Laura. Laura Starr abstains online. I'm going to start from the right side of the room. My right, sorry, your left. Um, Jill Goodkind, you, you just need to say your name when I point at you. Goodkind abstains. Forsberg abstains. Jew abstains. Zelter abstains. Rock abstains. Roman abstains. You abstains. Are there any recusals? Lerner Hearing abstains. None. Lerner abstains. Thank you, Mr. Lerner. Anybody else online? Are there any recusals? Hearing none, motion passes. All right, last and not least, and this is roll call. In our committee, as we were talking about- 12 this, minutes. Right, yeah, and as we are talking about um, the Battery Park City Authority finances, they did a presentation. Part of what was discussed was the joint purpose fund and part was discussed was how that money is spent. What's how much is in there right now? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to waste time because Timmy won't let me and explain what the joint purpose fund is. I hope by now after having me talk about it, you, you know, because I've talked about this way too much. Depth. Yes. 
at least. Yes. So at the end of the day, this resolution is just asking that the funds that go into the joint purpose fund, which is separate from the from the money that goes to this, they both go to the city, but it's separate from the money that's in the general purpose fund that goes for police, fire, blah, 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 that nobody gets an accounting for. You know, everybody says, oh, it's my taxes. Well, yeah, that's my taxes. We don't ask for an accounting. For the joint purpose fund, we're asking for transparency and some accounting as to what is done with money, because all we know today in all the years of the joint purpose from being in existence, which is since 20, I'm sorry, 19, like 69 or something. And then 87 when it started to get funded is that $5 million is earmarked for the world trade center. The rest of it millions and million dollars. We don't know where the hell it went. Sorry. I'm coming to you, Jessica. Sorry. Put your hand up. If you have a question. You said it, uh, it's just about transparency, but it's also about community representation. Right? And, and I want to clarify that because that's the part that I find problematic. It's, I mean, these are essentially, these are essentially tax dollars. When you talk about Battery Park City, it's a unique situation, but having unelected people sit, you know, in a room somewhere determining where public funds or essentially public funds go, I find problematic. So you, you know, that exists currently. Every place because that is the a, current the, board is made up of private citizens. Yes. The current board from the Battery Park City Authority is made up of private citizens. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, anybody. So yeah. I, yeah. Th thank you for okay. sharing that. Just thank you. Good point. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see no hands online. I'm going to hear a call. I hear a second. I'm going to ask you to stop. stop stacking chairs while we do roll call because you can't hear. So I appreciate the love and the work and the help for the office. I cannot begin to tell you how much, but pause for a second for noise. So Mimi can do roll call. Brown Kennedy. Thank you. Cameron. Thank you. Cassell. Thank you. Chang. Thank you. Chapman. Thank you. Charcutian. Yes. Thank you. Coleman. Thank you. Corman. Corman. Co Thank you. Kucha. Thank you. Curtis. Thank you. Airman. Okay. Flores. Thank you. Flynn. Yes. Forsberg. Thank you. Friedman. Thank you. Froman. Thank you. Galloway. Thank you. Goldstein. Is he online? No. Good kind. Thank you. Grayson. Thank you. James. James yes. Thank you. Joyce. Joyce, yes. Thank you. Ju. Thank you. Kay. I abstain. Thank you. Lerner. Lerner, yes. Thank you. Lion. Thank you. Meltzer. Meltzer, yes. Thank you. Minsley. Yes. Thank you. More. Yes. Thank you. And yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Portia Corey. Thank you. Robinson. Yes. Thank you. Rossi. Thank you. Shear. Thank you. Star. Staying. Thank you. Jimmy Sung. Oops. Thank you. Vera, yes, thank you. Uh, Townley. Thanks. Uh, Eric, you. Thank you. Only person with one whole name. Seltzer. Thank you. Thank okay. You. So housekeeping notes for everybody before we adjourn the meeting. Uh, I think this setup for our meeting worked really well today. I apologize if you were online and I missed your hand raised. 
I want to say thank you to everybody for your patience and we may be here in March. Arrive early to help set up. Meeting is adjourned at 924. Please help stack the chairs and put the tables away.